Good morning. The time is now 9.32, 9.31. We'll give ourselves the, the, the benefit of the doubt. And a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of April 10th, 2018 is called to order. I'm co-president Dr. Richard Ziley, and I'll be cha chairing the morning portion of the meeting in the absence of State Superintendent Brian Whiston. The first item on the agenda is approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items to add or delete from the agenda? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the agenda and order of priority as is printed. So moved. Support. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All, all aye. opposed, nay. Motion carries. There is an information folder here, information on the Special Education Advisory Committee, members at large, big folder, one page. Um, no action is required at this meeting. The staff is asking the board members to submit nominations for individuals to serve on the Special Education Advisory Committee. Board approval will be requested at the May 8th board meeting. Matter of housekeeping, I've been asked to share. Uh, you have probably noticed that the restrooms on this floor are being renovated. Uh, there are restrooms available in the main hallway on all the other floors. We apologize for inconvenience. What do they say? The short term inconvenience means long term improvement or whatever. <laughs> all right. And now, at this time, Marilyn Schneider, uh, executive of the board, will introduce members of the State Board of Education. Good morning. I am Marilyn Schneider. I'm the State Board Executive, and I'll introduce the people around the table, members of the board. Um, seated where you'll notice this is not Brian Whiston. It is Sheila Alice. She's the Chief Deputy Superintendent. Chairing the meeting today, as you have already heard, is Dr. Richard Ziley. He resides in Dearborn, and he's co-president of the board. And the other co-president of the board residing in Rochester Hills is Cassandra Albrich. Michelle Fecto is the board's secretary. She lives in Detroit and she's on her way. Nikki Snyder lives in Dexter. She's the NASB delegate to the board. That's their association, National Association of State Boards of Education. Seated at the table is this year's Michigan Teacher of the Year, Luke Wilcox. When he's not with us, he's teaching high school math in Kentwood Public Schools at East Kentwood High School. And across the table is Tyler Sawyer. He's representing the governor from the governor's office. He is the St senior strategy advisor for education and career connections. Next to him is board member Eileen Weiser from Ann Arbor, and then Lupe Ramos Montini from Grand Rapids, Pamela Pugh, board member from Saginaw, and the seat next to me is for Tom McMillan, but he's joining us by phone today from Oakland Township. Hi, Tom. Hi there. OK. Very good. And now we have introduction of, uh, of staff uh, here. Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent, would you introduce new MDE employees? Thank you. It's our pleasure to uh, introduce Carrie Day uh, from our Office of Health and Nutrition Services. If you could just share a little bit about your role uh, here in the department. Uh, I'm a new analyst. Um, I've been hired to work in the Office of Health and Nutrition, and I provide technical assistance, monitor and review school nutrition programs. Um, and my previous experience is with both state and local government uh, in the field of emergency management, where I drafted <coughs> policies and procedures for school safety programs, as well as all things emergency management. About a month into my job, and I'm really enjoying it. Okay, Deputy Superintendent Shalon. Good morning, uh, Shalon Dotsey, Interim Deputy Superintendent. I'm excited to be here. I uh, spent 10 years as a current technical education teacher at Niles High School uh, teaching marketing and entrepreneurship. 
also very proud to say that Chelsea Martinez is a high school CTE student. This is the communications director at the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. She was one of my students uh, back in the 1990s when I was a teacher. I then went forward. I just aged you out. I'm sorry. That's okay. Then I went forward, <laughs> then I went forward uh, to um, the ISD system, and I was a current technical education director under Patty Cantu's leadership in the department for 15 years at the Shiawassee RESD in Barry and Risa. And I took about an 18 month study as a private consultant when I retired from service, and I'm pleased to be here as your next state director for current technical education. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. All right, Sheila Ollis. Yes, good, have... morning. good morning, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Scott Blakeney. Scott is the new director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Implementation. And Scott, if you'd like to share a few words with everyone this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, like she said, Scott Blakeney, I'm new to the department. I've been with the state for about 15 years uh, at Community Health, DHHS, Treasury, and Military and Veterans Affairs. In those previous roles, I was responsible for strategic planning for DHHS and a number of other things that I look forward to bringing here and working on uh, progressing our strategic plan, top 10 and 10, way of work, and all those other great things we use to support the state of Michigan. And uh, I'm from the east side and uh, Detroit guy. Uh, then started moving west, Redford, Livonia, Farmington Hills, Milford, and I live in Grand Haven now, so it's a bit of a fun. <laughs> but I drove to Lansing for five years uh, working at DHHS, and I, I'm used to it. So um, anyhow, welcome and have a great meeting. Thanks. Okay, Deputy Superintendent Vanessa Kiesler, is she here today? Okay. Um, but, but so you'll but, step so in. So I will step in. I'm looking to see if um, Paula Daniels she, is. She's not able to be here. Not able just, to be here. So I will make the announcement that Paula Daniels is the new director of the combined offices of um, Office of Field Services and the Office of Educator Innovation and Improvement. Um, we've merged those two offices, and Paula Daniels is the new director of that office. The name of the office is still to be determined. The staff within those two offices, now one office, um, they're selecting the name of their new office. And as Paula has taken on that responsibility, <coughs> Linda Forward has a new assignment, and Linda is our new executive, um, senior executive policy advisor. We are... Um, thrilled to have her in this new position, and if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you. I'm just looking forward to the new challenges. I think we've got some work to do, and I'm looking forward to working with Sheila to get that done. Very good. Yeah. Very good. And maybe when we come up with a name for the position, we can uh, meet Paula Daniels next meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. Did we miss any new employees who are in the room? All right. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for your service. Okay. Now, uh, for our visitors, uh, if you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it to Marilyn Snyder. Marilyn, do you have a sample form handy? They're right outside the glass wall right there. They're okay. green. The green form. Uh, they are uh, on the table just outside the boardroom. They must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. And that is planned for approximately 1 p.m. today following the board's lunch break. Please be here at that time to make sure you have the opportunity to comment. Okay. Oh, and um, I uh, neglected, I skipped over the part. Would audience members please introduce themselves? And I guess we traditionally start with Marty Ackley there in the Hi. corner. Yes, I'm, excuse me, Martin Ackley. I'm the director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Good morning. I'm Caroline Leepin. I'm the legislative liaison with the Department of Education. Good morning. Chelsea Martinez with the Secondary School Principals Association. Do you head Office of Public and Governmental Affairs? Lily Schulte. I'm a community disability advocate from Grand Rapids. Good morning, Alicia Fly, Chief Academic Officer, what we call Intermediate School District. Good morning, Paul Salah, we Risa. Karen Slumber, Superintendent, Calhoun Intermediate School District. Sutherland, Washington, Woods Middle School, a Hope Public School principal. Uh, David Hornack, Superintendent, Hope Public School. 
Neil Cronkite, fifth grade teacher, Washington Woods Public Schools. Jennifer Cronkite, a skilled voice. He is reading director of the Office of Educator Excellence here at MBD. Global manager and Office of Educator Excellence. Debbie Brinson, executive director of the School Community and Health Alliance, representing the school based and school based health centers across the state. <coughs> Kevin Lavery, the education reporter for WKAR Public Radio. Chris Claver with Gongwar News Service. Fran Luce, facilitator for Michigan Special Education <coughs> Advisory Committee. Dedrick Martin, director of Office of Partnership District and SRO. Good morning, Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations. Good morning, Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent for the Division of Educator, Student, and School Support. Good morning, Shalana Baxley, Interim Deputy Superintendent. Good morning, Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff for State Superintendent Brian Weston. Uh, good morning again, Brian Piles, the CT Director for MDE. Neil Cole, OCT. Very good. Again, thank you for spending some of your valuable time with us at this meeting. All right. Uh, the first item on the committee of the whole agenda is the presentation of the Michigan 2017-2018 Millican Award winner. In February, Chief Deputy Superintendent Sheila Aulis, did I pronounce that right? Yes. Thank you. And State <laughs> Super and State Board of Education member Tom McMillan helped announce the Michigan 2017-2018 Milken Educator. Neil Cronkite, a fifth grade math and science teacher at Washington Woods Middle School in Holt Public Schools, was the recipient of this year's award. Congratulations, Neil. Leah Breen is coming to the table to introduce Neil and share additional information. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As Dr. Ziley mentioned, the Michigan Department of Education and the state of Michigan was once again lucky enough and honored to have a Milken Education Foundation Award recipient this year. Um, I'd like to ask Neil Cronkite to stand, please, and be recognized. <coughs> Thank you. And also, Neil has brought some guests with him. Jenny Cronkite, Walt Sutherland, who is the principal of Washington Woods Middle School, and David Hornack, the superintendent of Holt Public Schools. Thank you all for joining us here today. For those of you who are unaware of the Milken Education Foundation and the Milken Family Foundation, let me give you a brief synopsis. The Milken Education Foundation was founded by Michael and Lowell Milken in 1982. The Milken Family Foundation strives to discover and advance inventive, effective ways of helping people help themselves and those around them lead productive and satisfying lives. The mean, this means the, the means most conducive to achieving these goals is through education. The belief that young people are not only our greatest natural resource, but our greatest national resource has been the guiding philosophy behind Milken's groundbreaking education reform initiatives. Whether founding the nation's preeminent teacher recognition program, the Oscars of Education, if you will, promoting excellence through academic achievements, preserving and expanding a cultural legacy, or pioneering the nation's most successful comprehensive education reform system, the Milken Family Foundation continues to champion strategies that elevate education in America and around the world. Now, I'd like to take a moment to show everyone the video of Neil accepting his award. <laughs> so we found an educator to represent your school, your state, and the country. Do you know who it is? Do you know who it is? And the local educator award goes to Neil Cronkite.
Sandra, Hi. would you join me in uh, presenting the obelisk uh, here? There might be more. We're at Link. We wanted to show you how we created our <laughs> Link <laughs> website. Now that you know that having a great web. There you go. <laughs> well, it's our deep honor to be able to hand this award to you and recognize and thank you for your service to our students here in Michigan and setting an inspiring example for many of our students. Congratulations. There's uh, photo ops, so uh, you may want to take the next two minutes, scout out the restrooms. <laughs> sure, have your, have your guests come up here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So thank you for indulging me. I was given a microphone twice during this process and never had any words because I was totally surprised <laughs> or um, just not sure what to say. So I, I had some time to think about this one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ziley, and thank you, board. Um, this was a complete surprise and a total honor. Um, I didn't even know the Milken Foundation existed until they showed up at our school and started talking about what they did, and um, it, it was incredible. Um, it's been really fun to travel on this journey with my students so far, and, and it, it was interesting how when I got the award, they started sitting up a little bit straighter and paying attention kind of for the first time in their life that like this thing that they do every day and take for granted is something that could be meaningful and is meaningful. Um, one of the goals of the Family Foundation, I see some of you have their pamphlets, um, is to celebrate teachers and to elevate the profile of teaching, and I think they certainly accomplished that through their award um, ceremony. So recently, as part of winning the award, I was able to go to Washington, D.C., um, and I was in a room with over 70 other Milken winners, um, former and current, um, and one of the themes that came up again and again and again was um, that the Milken Award is not supposed to be a lifetime achievement award, that it's supposed to be um, an indication of things still to come. And I, and I really appreciated that because one thing that I share with my students is a quote that says, the only person that we should try and be better than is the person we were yesterday. And so if I was good enough, you know, figuratively, yesterday to win this award, then I have some work to do to keep moving forward. Um, you know, I still have some growth to do as a teacher and, and a leader. And while in Washington, I spent a lot of time networking with other teachers um, about what's next for me and for my classroom and for our school and just for ed education as a whole. Um, there were sessions at the Milcom Forum um, on topics like school culture. We heard a really dynamic speaker that talked about closing students' attitude gap before you can close their achievement gap. They need to believe in themselves before they can achieve. Um, we talked about specific strategies for engaging students in science. I met a guy from uh, uh, Massachusetts that raps in his class and makes up raps to do the parts of a cell and things like that. I'm like, all right, that's something I can try sometime. Um, and I had also the chance to go to a congressional reception um, in the Kennedy caucus room, which was just phenomenal and, and, a, and a great experience. Um, this whole forum, though, was fulfilling in a way that very few professional conferences really are. And I, and I wish that every teacher had the opportunity to just get away for a few days and spend time in professional conversations that, that inspire us and engage us and keep us moving forward. So I really want to be a part of the conversation both at Holt and wherever else my voice is needed to keep talking about teacher leadership and what's best for our students. Um, while I have this platform, I wanted to thank for a second Dr. Horneck and Mr. Sutherland. Um, while I was in Washington, I ran across a number of teachers that unfortunately had to use up all of their sick and personal days to attend this forum, to serve on national boards um, like the go governor's board and things like that. And I always took it for granted that there's a district that supports the professional things that we do in Holt and um, understand that when I go to things like this, I can bring learning back to our district to make us all um, better. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't thank my wife also. She is a huge cheerleader for me and always believes in me, even when I'm not sure about myself. Um, and I think, I, I hope that we're all lucky enough to have a partner like that that supports us 
Um, so thank you very much, and I look forward to continuing any conversations that come out of this and anything that we talk about in the future. So thank you very much. Okay. The next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation on Career Readiness Initiative, the Marshall Plan for Talent. The Marshall Plan calls for investing $100 million in innovative programs to revolutionize Michigan's talent and education system. It will support schools that want to transform education through programs like competency-based certification, world-class cult curricula and classroom equipment, scholarships, stipends, and support for career navigators and teachers. The funding will complement the more than $225 million in funding dedicated to ongoing talent development efforts in Michigan. This aligns with the goals and strategies to make Michigan a top 10 education state in 10 years, and the Michigan Pathways Alliance launched last summer uh, and we will continue to work hand in hand with the governor to provide opportunity to all Michigan students. Our presenters are Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff for the State Superintendent's Office, and Tyler Saw Sawyer, uh, Senior Strategy Advisor for Education and Career Connections of the Governor's Office. Okay. Good morning, and thank you very much um, for allowing us to um, speak with you this morning about MDE's work on the Career Readiness Initiative, as well as its connection to the Governor's Marshall Plan for Talent. I'm very pleased to be here with Tyler this morning um, as we continue talking about this. Um, first, I just very quickly wanted to begin um, with a timeline of our Career Pathways work. This is sort of a short-term timeline because we have been doing this work um, for some time in terms of career readiness. Um, however, I just wanted to call attention to a couple of things. Um, the first would be in December um, 2015, the Reaching for Opportunity um, report was issued. Um, uh, many of you um, were a part of that report by our um, past president, John Austin, of the State Board of Education. And this talked about um, post-secondary opportunity for students after high school. Um, shortly after that, MDE began a partnership with the CCSSO, which is um, the organization that serves uh, state school chiefs or state superintendents uh, like Brian. Um, and this organization put forth a grant called the New Skills for Youth. Um, MDE um, did apply for this grant. Um, and while unfortunately we were not able to receive the grant, we were um, invited by CCSSO to partner with them on a career readiness initiative, and they spent time coaching us, and you'll see that pops up in other places in this timeline. Um, there are also just some recognition of other events that occur occurred during this time. Um, the GTIB, uh, the Governor's Talent Investment Board um, resolution that had some recommendations around this, um, the AIR study of Michigan's uh, career in tech ed, um, and other um, work that went on. And this is just a, a continuation of the calendar. Um, the print was small enough. I was trying, I didn't want to put it all on one page for that purpose. So this continues on with the governor's introduction of the governor's 21st Century Education Commission report. Um, and in March um, of last year, so just about a year ago, um, TED and MDE, um, TED being the Talent and Economic Development, um, and that is... Uh, the director is Roger Curtis, who unfortunately could not be here with us today to also join us in this presentation. Um, however, um, we began a partnership, he and Brian Weston, um, on how we could achieve principle four of the 21st Century Ed Commission guiding principle, um, as well as our top 10 and 10. Um, several goals um, were accomplished in this work. Um, while that work was progressing, um, and I'll just kind of transition here into, um, oh, I'm sorry. If I go backwards. Thank you. Um, that work um, was done as a result of some information that we received from WIN, the Workforce Intelligence Network. Um, and this is a slide that um, many of you, I'm, I'm hoping and guessing, have probably seen before, but that indicates the online job postings versus the um, certifications, the completions um, of students in our state. And it's a demonstration of sort of a gap that we um, have and that we foresee um, only increasing in the future. And so this is, 
Oh, I'm sorry. When you say students, are you talking about K-12 or are you talking about college? Um, I think this is both. Yes, it's a combination of the two. What they're, What is being put forth in terms of um, degrees or credentials or certificates? So um, just quickly moving on, as a result of the Career Pathways Alliance, um, there was discussion about changing the conversation. Um, and uh, these, are, um, these are slides that normally Director Curtis would share, but I'm just going to run through them um, very quickly. What we're talking about really is the idea that we have, we create multiple pathways for students and that we help students understand um, what they want to do. And we can do that through a multiple um, approaches in K-12 through higher education, through lifelong learning. And so um, the career ladders um, were also a conversation that we began having about how we can place students early um, in, um, in potential career experiences to help them learn. And that career ladders are what we are working on. This is the concept that a student, um, a, an individual can start um, at an entry level and then continue their training. And later um, in the presentation, we're gonna talk more about this. I also, um, just very quickly, um, Going Pro is, in, is an online um, application and website um, that launched in August. It allows students to access um, career pathways, um, multiple um, potential opportunities for jobs. So I just wanted to be sure that you were aware of that tool that is being used. Um, and then, um, as mentioned during the timeline, the Michigan Career Pathways Alliance is a, a partnership that was created um, through work between um, Director Curtis and Superintendent Whiston. Um, this slide gives you an understanding of who participated in the work groups that were held um, last late spring. Um, we had uh, many school uh, partners as well as partners from ISDs, um, higher education, um, employers, and our trade associations. Um, the uh, result of the Career Pathways Alliance was a set of recommendations as well as um, an executive directive that was put forward by Superintendent Whiston, um, and those things served to promote student success and in these areas that are noticed here. So again, we're, we're focused on career discovery, the idea of students in K through 12 um, having the ability to um, look at and experience um, firsthand the different careers options that are available to students, um, to increase the use of tools such as career cruising and My Bright Future and Pathfinder. Um, these are things that are being used in our schools currently to help students explore careers and learn what's necessary to um, get to those careers. Um, we've discussed the um, increasing the use of the education development plans, and many of you know we've talked about legislation that's currently running in the Michigan legislature um, for this purpose, um, career counseling, and then the idea of implementing talent transcripts. Um, and that these would, in addition to the typical transcript that we see for students, um, include things such as competencies that students have earned and demonstrated um, mastery in, um, as well as any potential certifications or credentials that they may have um, earned, badging. Um, there's many things that are included in that. Um, we wanted to include an example of um, a career readiness uh, sort of plan that's being used. This is Kalamazoo County's, um, and I apologize for the small print, but it, it provides for you sort of an idea of how they process through from grade, from kindergarten all the way through high school. So we know there are many excellent examples of schools who are integrating this career readiness work um, in their curriculum um, and doing a really excellent job for Michigan kids. And then um, finally, we, we really wanted to work to expand CTE statewide um, and to have a conversation about how we can increase funding for students in CTE and 19, um, and also just encourage students towards um, better access to the multiple pathways. So that gets us to the Marshall Plan for Talent, and I will turn it over to Tyler. I think what you've seen is a really condensed and um, 
overview of a lot of work that um, that MDE and, and sometimes Wendy personally uh, and uh, a lot of folks here and at TED have done over the last few years. A lot of the groundwork for the Marshall Plan was laid out in those slides. And we view the Marshall Plan as a capstone for all of the stuff that the governor has done over the last seven and a quarter years. So you're going to see a lot of familiar things like dual enrollment um, or uh, early middle colleges or uh, skilled trades training funds. And a lot of things we've already done really laid the foundation for, for what the Marshall Plan uh, is, is now. So we view it as, as a capstone for the, the things that the department and Ted and the governor have been working on for, for quite some time. Um, today I'm going to talk about what that $100 million goes to support, but we view the Marshall Plan as much broader than that. So there is this large budgetary component, but there's also a lot of policy components to it as well. And we've laid out, you'll see on the slides, um, kind of funding pieces and then policy flexibility pieces. Um, and then you'll see some things that we're kind of already doing and just making better and then some brand new ideas. Um, so the Marshall Plan is a lot of stuff that's, that's uh, kind of old and new. It's policy uh, and budget as well. Um, I'm going to try to go through this super fast because I know that uh, you guys are going to have a lot of questions. Um, so if I gloss over detail, um, I, I apologize. Feel free to ask uh, uh, when we're done. So there's four uh, key things that uh, we want to touch on on the Marshall Plan. The first is the idea of, of talent consortia. And this is bringing educators and employers together in a way that goes beyond what we might, you know, just letters of support or, or handshakes. We want educators and employers to be working together in their day-to-day -day operations, figuring out how can, how can not only educators help employers, but also the other way around. We really are asking everyone in, in the, the, the P20 system and the, the, uh, you know, the employer system to change how they do their day-to-day their -day practices. Um, there's a heavy emphasis on, uh, we'll say, project-based learning and, uh, and, and credentials and, and competency-based education, and we're going to define those a little bit uh, a lot, in a lot more detail later. And then we really focus on what are the high-demand fields and, and credentials. Um, You've identified, uh, you know, kind of four four sectors that we know are in need of of talent, but then we look back and we really ask, what are the the skills that uh, students need, the soft and the technical skills, um, that are transferable and that will help them be successful in in those fields. So I'm going to start uh, describing a little bit of a, of a talent consortia. Um, you can see some of the the requirements here. Um, it has to be a district or ISD and at least two business partners. Um, if there are additional partners, um, then of course, you know, the more the better whenever uh, something is, uh, partnerships are, are being built. Um, and then they have to sign these things called uh, talent agreements, um, which are better described here. Um, and the talent agreement is really a description of how the members of a talent consortia are going, or talent consortium, are going to work together uh, to change the way that they create talent. Um, it's how they're going to create that seamless system from K-12 to post-secondary to career. Um, we, you know, one example is to focus on programs that lead to credentials and integrate into the Michigan Merit uh, Curriculum requirements. Um, it's a heavy focus on mastery and proficiency, so demonstrating a student is, is um, uh, actually able to do a thing as opposed to seat time. Um, but this is this we think is really one of the powerful mechanisms for creating that seamless transition from K-12 into higher education and, and then into career. And it's also important for schools because in order to access most of the funding that I'm going to talk about, schools need to be a party to one of these talent consortiums <coughs> and sign one of these talent agreements. Um, and this is a, a really good description of how we're trying to change that, that K-20, K-12 to higher ed and in, in, in a career, career ladder, as Wendy said. Um, the current system right now, we have these kind of silos where we, we learn a little bit in K-12, then we have to kind of start over and go to higher ed. And then we start over again into our first career, then start over again in our second career and third career. And as you can see here, apparently retirement, everything has been solved and and everyone's doing very, very well. Um, and that's how our system is built right now. We're trying to change that to an emerging reality where we start with really basic skills 
and then what we would call an uh, entry competency, and then build on those so that students have a base upon which to build their entire life. So this is how we're trying to build the, the system of, of lifelong learning. Um, so that no matter which career a student goes into, we know that they're going to they're gonna change careers multiple times over the course of, of their lives. They have competencies and skills upon which to build, and those transitions and those kink points don't, aren't, aren't there to, to be in their way. There's no barriers to, that, to lifelong learning. So um, I'm going to get into the details as to how the Marshall Plan supports schools and, and partnerships that, that want to actually do this. Um, first, uh, we're not funding specific programs in the Marshall Plan. We're really asking schools to come to us with their really cool and innovative ideas on how they want to do things differently, and then we're going to be funding those really cool things that they want to do. Um, so we're not, you know, we're going to see instead of you know saying you know X amount of dollars to this program, you're going to see dollars going to certain functions that that schools will be able to to uh, to perform. Um, we are working on, um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars in other stuff that the, the state does. We are working kind of behind the scenes to align those to the Marshall Plan. Um, but this is just emphasizing this slide is only about the hundred million dollars that um, we're, we're it's, it's grabbing headlines and we're talking about. And then just a disclaimer, um, this has to go through the legislature. So what you're going to see is only what's been proposed by, by the governor. We're very happy with the level of legislative uh, support that we're getting. But the legislative process being what it is, um, you know, we expect uh, changes. So these are the things that um, the Marshall Plan is, is, is going to support, and we're just going to kind of go down the list. The first one is the Talent Pledge. Um, this is a uh, series of scholarships and stipends for low-income citizens. Um, and it uh, is not just for high school graduates. Of course, they would, they would qualify, but, but really any low-income citizen. Um, you can see the, the amounts there, so it's $500 uh, in a scholarship for, two, for one year and two fifty dollars in a stipend um, for one year. We really had to, um, the, the stipend really goes to the barriers that low-income citizens experience when they are trying to access higher ed. Uh, we know that there's a lot of citizens that want to uh, go on to get a one- or a two-year credential, but they have barriers like transportation or, or child care. Um, so that's what that stipend goes to to support. Um, we expect these dollar amounts to make these one or two year credentials no cost for most citizens. Um, we say most because there are certain age and family um, uh, combinations that might throw this math off, um, but we, we expect it to it work out to be no cost for most citizens. Um, integrated into this is a really aggressive mentoring and coaching program um, because a lot of these, these folks um, perhaps only graduated high school and haven't engaged in, in higher ed, and maybe they graduated high school, it could have been 10 or 15 years ago. Um, this was based on the Detroit Promise program, um, this, this mentoring and coaching piece, but it, it really um, gets a, a coach and a mentor sort of in, in the student's face to help them through this process. We found that this, um, this type of mentoring or coaching can double, and in some cases, triple success rates for students that go into these types of programs. Um, we're looking to fund uh, curriculum development. Um, so this could be a school or, or a university um, that, that wants to help um, you know, create new, new curriculum. We do ask that there's uh, you know, some certain requirements that, you know, that's based on mastery and proficiency, so kind of a competency-based learning um, uh, curriculum. It has to be in a high demand field, and we're really asking that um, schools bring in businesses and kind of reverse engineer it for from what, is, what are the skills the business needs and, and then how can um, those, those skills fit into the Michigan Merit curriculum or the state standards and how can it help make education relevant to the, the students. We do want to be open source so that it can be um, you know, uh, uh, spread across the state. Um, and um, we do have some money set aside for MDE to provide Michigan Merit curriculum uh, integration assistance uh, to schools. Um, this is, uh, the, the, this is the uh, bucket that goes to expand um, programs, and you can see on the, on the left side there, these are the funding that we're, um, the Marshall Plan has proposed to support. So it's stipends for industry mentors in classrooms. If you want to bring in um, you know, a, uh, an industry uh, expert to help teach the class, we have testing fees, uh, small pieces of equipment. Um, we're willing to fund professional development for teachers and even hire full-time staff. Um, these are designed to be as kind of seed money for, for programs to get them up and running. 
And then on the right side, you can see that the flexibilities on the policy side that we're working on. Again, we'll, we can get into more detail on what this stuff looks oh, like. Um, oh, and, yep, go ahead. I'm sorry, before you move, yeah. I just want to finish reading it before you move oh, down oh, sure. to the slide. It, yeah, we can, you guys can interrupt with questions while I'm while going through okay. this. I think it's, that's a fine way to do it. You yeah. mentioned we are willing to fund. Who's the we? Uh, the state. So it'd be state. the state through a, a, we're proposing a competitive grant process. Okay, so what department of state would this committee or commission or whatever it is? It, so we're, we've really been impressed with how MDE and TED have been working together. So we're, a lot of this is actually a collaborative effort on the, on the you know, for, for MDE and TED uh, to work together to figure this out. Um, these grants we recognize are going to be a new process, um, and it's a little bit different from how we've done it in the past. Um, but uh, so it's going to be a lot of collaborative. We're still figuring it out, um, but we, we do expect it to be very collaborative between the departments, which we're really excited about. So it sounds to me like it would be it it would turn up at our meetings as grants to be approved after the department has worked out with whatever other inter interstate departments would be. Perhaps. There are some grants that are already in TED that we're building upon, so I don't want to say that's for every grant, Okay. Um, but, but that for some of them, that, that would certainly be a possibility. Well, thank you. That helps me get a grasp of how we relate to the process. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, we do have some dollars set aside for cybersecurity. Um, we know this is a huge budding field. Um, and Michigan is already a, a huge leader in this field, so we have some stuff set aside, not unlike the existing cybersecurity um, grants, except that we're trying to build a little bit more state infrastructure with the help of um, you know, the MICE group that, that presented here um, some months ago. Um, this, is, this is just one field that um, is really emerging and no one really is a leader yet, so we would love for Michigan to take the lead in, in cybersecurity talent. Um, Wendy alluded quite a bit to career navigating. Um, we have a couple different ways to go about uh, career navigating. Um, you might recognize this from a, an existing budget line item that puts these folks into schools. Um, these would be uh, career, I don't want to call them counselors because that's not the right word, but career navigators that work directly with a full-time counselor that focuses just on the uh, career and college navigating portion of, of counselor duties. We have some models across the state that this is this is building on, and we're happy to talk about. I'm happy to talk about those. Um, we are um, willing to to look into large equipment grants for schools. Um, this is one that we're really um, proud of. Some innovation that came out of um, MDE and TED on crowdfunding. Um, so essentially, for schools that um, are able to leverage crowdfunding, they uh, the state will chip in more matching funds and a higher limit to that. Um, and we can go into details on what that crowdfunding uh, might look like. Um, and then, of course, we have the existing flexibilities that have been a topic around on, on, C, on the, the teacher licensure and the Michigan Merit curriculum and, and that assistance. If I'm moving too fast, just let me know. Did I skip a slide? Nope. All right. The Innovative Teacher Corps is another thing that we're really, really proud of. Uh, back in 2011, the governor, um, in his special message on education reform, talked about uh, the creation of a master teacher corps. And this really builds on that idea. Um, and uh, MDE really helped to us to, to develop this. But this is a, a program where we go out and we find teachers that are doing really great and innovative things. And we help them bring that thing to other areas of the state. So these could be innovative things um, from like a flipped classroom to project-based learning or reading intervention or intervention at at-risk students, special ed. Um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty wide open. But it really gives teachers some type of recognition and maybe a little bit of an extra rung on their career ladder that isn't going into administration. We find that a lot of teachers want to kind of take that next step in their career, but they don't want to leave the classroom. Um, this gives teachers an opportunity to remain in the classroom, but really be an instructional leader in their region and across the state. Um, so um, this, this would involve teachers getting, uh, we're proposing a $5,000 stipend directly to the teacher. Um, it's, that'd be uh, $5,000 a year for three years. 
in addition to um, a stipend to the district to cover other costs related to that teacher being part of this. Um, so we're, we're really excited about, about this piece as well. Um, related to this is some critical shortage relief where we're, um, you know, we have some money set aside and we're proposing that MDE develop a uh, residency-based uh, teaching certificate that helps teachers move into high demand areas. Um, these are already existing and certified teachers um, that want to move into a, a, different, a different field. This will provide stipends to teachers to get that, that professional development and that additional learning. So competence-based learning, we've, we've, sorry. Quick sorry. question. Go ahead, sir. I didn't understand a condensed, um, yeah, yeah, condensed teaching it. certificate. I'm not sure what that means. So we are currently looking at the requirements specifically for career and technical education teachers to see how we can utilize the expertise of those who've served in the industry for a long time and get them into the classroom. Um, we have existing flexibilities, but we're continuing to study how we can make that happen. So condensed is uh, kind of a streamlined certification, is that, uh, or yeah. speed it up? Or? Yes, I think we're looking at how we potentially could use expertise along with um, like higher education credentials. Okay, thank you for unpacking mm -hmm. it for me. So Competency-based learning, there's, there's been a lot of talk on, on this. We have an existing um, uh, line item from last year's budget um, I just want to, so there's, there's two ways that competency-based learning touches the Marshall Plan. The first is that in all the stuff that you've seen before, um, you know, like the curriculum development stuff and, and the, trick, the talent pledge and creating new programs, we really want those to take on, you know, if, if, a if a school is getting money to do that, we want them to do their best to take on some of the philosophies of competency-based learning. And you see those here. Um, you know, where it's, um, it's a, a hands-on, project-based approach to, to learning where students move through the material as they master it. Um, we don't get too worked up on how much time they've spent on something. We only uh, really care about whether or not they're able to do that particular thing, um, which is, suggests that students will learn at their own pace and um, sort of be evaluated on those, those individual competencies. Are you trying to tell me that I only have so much time? No, um, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm looking. Sorry if I'm being distracting. Oh, okay. I'm checking out the next presenters to All make right. sure they're <laughs> um, uh, then we, um, let me finish and then we'll, we'll get to that real quick. Um, and then we really want schools to figure out what are the innovative, not just delivery models, but also the um, assessments for how students can prove that, they, um, that, that they're able to, to master something. So um, in the existing um, uh, line item and in the proposed language for this, we really look to ways for students to prove mastery through things like uh, teaching another student or creating a video or building something or having a talent portfolio or writing a research paper. It certainly could be taking a test and for some things that is sort of required like for certain certifications like the bar exam is a great example. You just have to take a test. There's no other way to do that. Um, but we really want schools to find better ways to, to, to do this and we do have some questions. Are you going to define project-based learning next? Is um, that your next slide? So, no, um, we can certainly talk about it. We have, we have so that's, I, I that. guess that's sure. my question then. We seem to use project-based learning and competency-based learning interchangeably. Yeah. And I don't think they're the same thing. So uh, are you, when you say, so you just define competency as teaching another student or making a video. My, my mm. concern with competency-based education is it's you do a thing, but you don't, have the content or the knowledge I mean you, I can write a paper and it could be complete gibberish so but have I satisfied the competency so I guess my question is are we really talking about competency-based education or are we talking about project-based education which to me is much more in-depth and content-based than just being able to push a button yeah the project-based learning we view as the most fitting delivery model for competence-based education. So when we say competence-based education, um, we mean, um, so one, one really good way to think about competence-based education is to actually look at the Michigan standards. Um, and those say, you know, students will be able to demonstrate that they know um, long division. Um, and there's multiple ways to prove that you know long division. It could be, you know, taking a test or it could be doing something else, such as teaching a third grader, you know, the basics of, of long division. 
Um, so the competencies um, are sort of doing a thing, but it's, it's, it's uh, um, doing a thing is how you prove that you have the content mastery, um, if, that's, if that's a way to explain it. And we just view project-based um, learning as, a, as a, the best delivery model for this, this type of, of comprehension. Let me just make sure that that cleared up your question, because mastery learning is that you have to know and be able to use 80% or more of a uh, content area to be able to move on to the next concepts. Because otherwise, think about Algebra 1. Uh, if you've got seed time where you've got 12 weeks to learn it and you get a D minus, have you mastered enough to be able to go on to the next Algebra 2 level? And the answer is absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, it, the assessments are embedded in the process. You're showing all the way through that you have worked on something and you, and you, you are either doing, yeah, math is a little bit harder for me, I'm a musician and an English, English language person, but you're writing papers, you're doing PowerPoints and the, you're doing uh, presentations, you are doing things that are on the large scale of the Michigan Merit curriculum, all parts of things that meet the standards and then that one is met. Could be any place and anything. Does that help? It does, but here's my concern. When you start throwing in now companies that are part of the process. So I work for a community college and I can tell you companies come to us all the time and say, we just bought this new piece of equipment and we need people who know how to use a piece of equipment. So we want you to infuse this now into your curriculum. <laughs> that doesn't do anybody any good other than the company. And now we're talking about bringing them into the classroom in a K-12 level and saying, we're gonna do competency-based education. My fear is, that the competency then becomes, how can I utilize these kids to fulfill a need that I have in my company, but not the overarching learning that they need so that they can work for any company. Right. So if I can keep on working this, because I think it's really important, it, 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 what, what it would be is that they'd be learning the math, learning the science, learning all the things that underpin what the machine what the machinery does. And that would be a marker. Their ability to use it would be one of the things that they have mastered the Michigan Merit Curriculum. Okay, so it's just, it, and, and for the company, mm -hmm. they're getting an employee who's able to do that. Now, I don't think that anybody wants to get a company in. You're talking about a specific vendor situation. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about companies saying, uh, whether it's an architect coming in or a manufacturing company, or um, you know, one of the things that I've watched uh, is um, tool and die cutters. The amount of math and science that goes into being a good tool and die cutter who can do anything in the company, understand how those things work, is, and business is profound. That doesn't mean that they will dominate what's learned. It means it'll be a way to get to the spot on the Michigan Merit Curriculum where that works. So there's a there's at least one school district in the UP right now that's teaching geometry by building Habitat for Humanity houses. Everything that they can cover in geometry that has to do with that construction project is visceral to the kids because they're living and learning it. It doesn't mean that they'll be able to teach all of geometry with that project. I had a question related to um, so for me, um, I see this as something that's potentially could be really great. Um, you know, I know kids learn differently, and I'm not about out adding more testing um, because I think our kids are and our schools are completely over tested, and um, and I think the results of that are um, can be incredibly negative. So um, my concern, and again from having lived through the EAA and witnessed the EAA. Um, where they promised everyone some of the same lingo, everyone's going to be learning at their own pace, and it's going to be all this, you know, uh, this great technology and all this great stuff. But when, but there was um, not adequate oversight. Um, there were there were not people listening to the teachers on the ground um, who were saying this is not good. <laughs> um, so my my concern is. Uh, what is the role of the teacher? Because right now we rely on teachers to um, let us know what kids are mastering, what kids aren't. They're with them in the classroom and how they develop that. If they do more project stuff, I think that's great. I think that's a really good vehicle. Um, but I trust a teacher who has a relationship with these kids rather than going and taking a, a program test um, that may or may not be an adequate uh, assessment, um, and again, it's more testing, uh, and relying and relying less on the teacher and more. On, my fear is that it's relying less on the professionals in the building 
to teach and determine things and more on some pre-programmed um, you know, uh, technology that may or may not be up to snuff. And, um, and there's a lot of money to be made in this process. So I, I, so I, 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 on one hand, I think it sounds, uh, the, the ideas behind it are really promising, but I, I want to ensure that there is adequate oversight to make sure that it's not uh, these vendors coming in and um, with promises like, again, like the EAA with and people in the behind the scenes who are going to make a, a hand over fist money making promises and spending a lot on PR, but <laughs> not li in, you, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So I would like to know the structures for oversight to ensure that, that, that as this is being implemented, um, that there is clear, um, there's clarity about what's happening. There's room to listen to criticism and improve, um, and that the and that the MDE is going to be fully embedded in making sure that the curriculum development, whatever that is, that the experts in this department are are uh, are going to be be given the weight of making a lot of those decisions, not um, uh, legislators, frankly. So I'm going to move on to the next slide because I think that is going to help a little okay, bit. Okay, thank um, you. So um, the way that we view competence-based learning is that it's not new, right? There's a lot of examples of the philosophies of competency-based learning being done all across the state right now. Um, and some of these districts you've invited in to, to, to talk about. Um, I want to go uh, specifically to the uh, your question, Michelle, on, on sort okay. of the structures. So not unlike the existing um, competence-based learning grants, um, these would go through MDE, and, and there's already requirements built into those. And In fact, in our proposed language, there's a feedback loop with the districts where they come back to the state and they say, here's what worked and here's what didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's you know, something that we, we didn't do well, the, the schools will be coming back to us to, to tell us that. The second thing is we're not telling any school what, what vendor to use or what curriculum to use. Like I said at the beginning, we're really asking schools to come to us with their ideas as to how they want to do this. Um, so we expect there to certainly be different practices, which is okay because that's kind of, we, we want folks to, to figure out what works best for, for, their, for their schools and, and their kids. Um, so we would, we would hope that a school doesn't dive into this without you know, having talked to their teachers and parents and we actually have some stuff in the grant language related to, to talking to parents and, and, and teachers. Um, the other thing that we've been really impressed with uh, related to competence-based learning is that it, it really helps students with those, you know, depending on what you want to call it, you know, there's a whole bunch of different C's or 21st century skills because it, it really helps students create the, that sort of perseverance and grit where failure is a learning opportunity and <laughs> not uh, something to be, to be ashamed of. And we're going to get um, to that in a, in a second. Um, and we, we, we also have been doing quite a little bit of research on, on competency-based learning um, and, uh, and, and how it affects not just um, you know, student um, self-efficacy, but also how it looks on, on standardized assessment, knowing that you know, there are multiple methods to prove competencies um, other than, than just tests. So I think one really good way to show this is, is actually like show an example. So we have a video of, um, of, of competence-based learning um, actually going on in, in Van Buren right now. I want to kind of inspire people to push the limits on what they think they might be able to do. Look, this, this blind kid can cable up a complicated network with Cisco routers and he can program it to work properly. What can I do? I am Jacob Brink. I am 17 years old. I am blind, of course, and that can make life challenging, but having been blind so long, I've, I managed to pull through, so I'm really not much different than any other teenager. I love to play with tech, I love to learn about new tech, I love to tear things apart, put them back together. Typical day usually would entail getting set up on my computer, and then I go to work on labs, so I'll cable up my routers and switches. This year I'm doing the routing and switching Cisco and Etiquette curriculum. Mr. Hoffman's never had a blind kid before, so this is all new to him, and it's like, 
how are we going to do things? How are you going to tear apart a computer? We had to work on it, and we had to kind of figure it out. He's an amazing kid, and uh, it's funny to have him refer to, okay, here's what I'm seeing, because he feels like that's what he's seeing, and he is seeing it. He's just seeing it a different way. He does an amazing job of using any tool possible to get through what he needs done. For my hands-on final for IT Essentials, I was able to take apart a computer and put it back together all by myself with no help. After I graduated high school, I plan to go on to college. I'm looking at Baker College, and I want to continue my study of the Cisco curriculum and get a lot of my certification. My dream job would potentially be network administrator, working from home so I can work in my pajamas if I wanted to. <laughs> Maybe making really, really big money. I don't know if it's going to come true, but you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try for that. So that's a really good example of a partnership between a business and, in this case, a, an ISD to provide a competence-based learning curriculum that results in not just technical skills, but we also saw Jacob's really strong soft skills like perseverance and, and communication. Um, is there any questions related to, to this? I know this has been a topic of discussion. What specifically did Cisco provide in this situation? Uh, Cisco provided the curriculum um, and a lot of the equipment. I think they also provide, actually I know they provide professional development to the teachers as well. Okay. Is, was there any, oh sorry, don't know who to. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when, it, when, we, when they talk about funding and maybe sustained funding, um, do our employers, um, was there a consideration of asking employers to actually provide money, like on a, in a sustained way? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, especially ones who are benefiting or who are getting incredible tax credits <laughs> um, m might want to uh, chip in for public Cer education. Certainly. Yeah. Um, this, is, sure. this, this goes back to what I said earlier, that we, we're asking not just schools to change, but also businesses and employers to change what they're doing as well. So through things like the, um, the, like the, uh, the large equipment grants are a great example that provides a direct mechanism <coughs> for businesses to chip in um, to kind of put their money where their mouth is to, if they want equipment in a school, they need to start providing some of that, some of the funds for that. We're also asking them to really spend time and, and resources and expertise in schools. Um, you know, you can't, you know, to, to, to the example earlier, you can't just walk into a school, hand them a welding machine and say, teach students to learn this. Um, there needs to be an integration of the Michigan Merit curriculum, and that business is going to have to work with schools to figure out how that's going to happen. Maybe they're going to have to provide mentors um, to, to, to students. Um, we're also looking at asking businesses to start changing the way that they, they do their hiring practices. Um, are hiring practices uh, not really aligned with, with the skills that, that students have or, or don't have? Um, should we be looking at um, not just resumes, but also talent portfolios and, and um, looking at different uh, skills that, that different students will have. So everyone's going to have to change the way that, that they do things. So if they're providing the equipment, does that mean they would get a certificate that's universally recognized, or is it going to be equipment that is unique to that one employer? Yeah, so there, we're really focused on, on um, uh, st the, the buzzword is stackable credentials and transferable credentials. So these are credentials that not only you can build on, but you can take to a multitude of, of companies. Um, we'll say, I'll say the mo most of them will be things you can, you can take even amongst different industries. Um, there are certain uh, credentials, like the, the Cisco credentials, that are going to, there's just so many openings, millions and millions and millions of openings, and they're going to be around forever, um, that are a little bit different. Um, but you know, when it comes, you know, we, we, we certainly, back to the, the model that I showed earlier of lifelong learning, we're not looking at for credentials that are going to pigeonhole a student into a dead end uh, that's career. Concern. That's just not what we're interested in, and we, we know what those are, and we're, we're avoiding those. So uh, we're Tom? looking for those, the oh. skills that can transfer. Yeah. Uh, McMillan, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. I'm wondering what grades uh, is Tyler and the uh, governor thinking this would be impacting? Uh, 11th and 12th, or how far down are you going? Uh, well, <laughs> so it's uh, we'll, we'll stick to grade levels, knowing that competence-based learning is really applicable. Um, if a student, if a student can prove that you know, so if Jacob can prove that he knows 
how to do networking when he's 14, then he should be able to prove that he knows how to do networking when he's 14. We shouldn't wait until he's in a particular grade level. The Marshall Plan, though, and the funding that we've talked about can be for any grade level um, from, from K through 12. There are certain skills you can think of like um, programmatic thinking um, that are really important or, or critical thinking or grit that are important for, for students to have. And we know we need to build those early, um, you, know, you know, first, second, third grade. So the, the, the proposal language is, is certainly open enough for, um, for students to, to be experiencing and benefiting from these dollars uh, very, very early on. I'll use the example of first well, thought. I, Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I guess I would be, I'd be concerned about, um, you know, what, what is going to be ignored when we're doing this. So I know a lot of people are concerned about the level of reading and math that our uh, younger kids have right now. So if we're going to introduce other things that are going to um, uh, divert, divert any focus. I, I just, you know, there's always a cost. It always sounds nice and that, uh, you know, plans are, 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 can sound real nice, but there's always unintended consequences. And um, so I, I just want to make sure that, uh, and also it sounds like it's a real fundamental change in education, which I'm a little concerned that the executive branch uh, may not, they're kind of getting into areas that maybe they, uh, shouldn't be. Uh, but also, I, I share uh, Michelle and uh, Cassandra's concerns just about um, uh, just, you know, the, the purpose of education is not to get a job, uh, K-12 particularly, and it's also not to fill the needs of uh, the current businesses. And uh, I hear a lot of, you know, that we're going to have career ladders, uh, which I disagree with, but then there's also multiple, you know, the recognition there's going to be multiple careers. Uh, so is it really like look, like Luke Glazer would say, rock climbing? Uh, and are we going to be giving too much specifics, uh, helping them learn how to weld when uh, that may be something that's not going to be useful in a few years or in a decade? Uh, so I, there's a lot of concerns here, and I'm glad that it's going to be flushed out in the legislature as well, but um, we'll, we'll be weighing in on it also. Yeah, I, I think um, it is a fundamental shift because fundamental challenges require fundamental changes to 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 address them because right now the the system we have is just not working for 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 quite a few students um, but I just want to reiterate that we're not interested in telling a student you have to go into welding this is you know it's completely up to the student and their parents as to as to what they want to go in we're really trying to create multiple pathways for for students depending on on their interests, because right now there kind of is only one way to get into higher education, and we need to create more and better ways for students to access higher education. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think Pam was. I think Pam was saying. And, you know, just building on what Tom, Cassandra, and Michelle um, have talked about, obviously we see opportunity here, but um, I think um, just backing up what they're saying, uh, when I first came on to the State Board of Education, I had the opportunity to sit on the NASBEs, um, the National Association of State School Boards uh, Career Readiness Work Group. And one of the issues that came up across the country is how parents, particularly com uh, parents in communities of color and low-income communities, are not participating in the career readiness activities in the numbers that we would want to see them participating in. And that's because of the historical factors that have led to children, students being tracked into dead-end jobs. So um, not only are the concerns on this end, but we still have parents who still who still have uh, that thought in mind of these programs that we have to overcome. So putting all of these mechanisms in place and making sure that we're, uh, first of all, making sure that, that it's not dead ending, you know, putting kids into dead end careers or, or but uh, providing educational opportunities so that their pathway is, you know, that they have the pathway to go or opening up the pathway to go in any direction that they want to go in but um, making sure that those barriers are, are not there and that we're removing those barriers, addressing it. But then we also have to overcome parents who, who see, who still can't get that out of their mind that this is what these programs are about. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that stigma is, is certainly something that, um, we actually have some even dollars dedicated to help overcome that. Um, but I wanna point to, to Jacob's really good example um, so he will he will graduate high school with a, a certification that he can use to get a very high paying job. 
he can then, as he plans, use that to go on to higher education. That job will help him pay for higher education. Um, and, and he will graduate with less debt and years of work experience that students in the traditional track uh, don't simply don't have. These are the types of, of innovative ways um, to get students into higher education that, that we're looking to do. It's, it's certainly different, um, as, as you say, um, but we, we think that it's, it's, it's time and, and that students and parents are starting to understand that we have to figure out a way to do this differently. Uh, so I'm going to push back on one thing that you said, but then I have a question. Um, so you said that, you know, what we're doing today isn't working, and that's why we need fundamental change. And I would just remind everybody that what we were doing used to work really well, and then we had fundamental change. And the more fundamental change we get, the lower our results are. So I would say first do no harm. So I think, you know, it's, it's important that we have, we really flesh this out and have these conversations because yes, it is a fundamental change, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to advancement. Um, you know, it could actually have the opposite effect. So just keeping that in mind that reform has not served this state well. Um, the second thing I would say, you talked about, you know, being able to get into higher education, but I haven't heard you really talk about colleges or universities, particularly the role of community colleges in this entire role. I mean, we have a whole infrastructure. We have 26 community colleges. So what do you foresee as their role being as part of this overall structure? Yeah, the, the first slide on the, the, the talent pledge is... Um, uh, I don't want to say it's targeted to community colleges, but they are certainly the best position to take advantage of that. There's a lot of universities out there, too, Ferris State comes to mind, that are really well positioned to take advantage of that. Um, but we, we really sort of built it knowing that community colleges would have a huge role in offering those talent pledge scholarships and stipends to, to students. Um, the, uh, the, the curriculum grants are, are another piece um, where... Um, a lot of universities um, have some really great uh, curriculum development processes and things that they're doing, and so they can access dollars to create new curriculum. Um, and then uh, the grant related to hiring full-time staff is something that a community college or university can also access. Um, one of the, the challenges that we see with universities expanding some of their programs is the startup costs. So the governor being a venture capitalist, he wanted to provide seed money for universities to, to start those up. Um, we also have certain partnerships related to um, the, uh, to, you know, to your point, Cassandra, I'm making sure this works. We have, um, I think it's two or $4 million set aside for program evaluation of the Marshall Plan. And we're looking to partner with a research university to really dig deep into the data and tell us like, you know, first, um, is this still a high demand field? Um, is this program working? How do we need to change it? Um, and, and what can be better. So we have some, uh, certainly some, some places set aside for, uh, for, for uh, universities. But much broader than those things is the talent consortium. That's, that's the mechanism that we're looking to build the P20 systems. And the best consortium, consortia are going to have those community college and higher ed partners. Um, you know, so me personally, I graduated from high school and went to a community college, got some credits and saved a bunch of money for my university experience, right? Um, and, and so building that type of, of pathway is, is what we're trying to figure out and get schools to think about and do in, um, in these talent consortia. Um, so their, their role is the, for universities and community colleges, not just, you know, in specific line items, but also in that broad talent consortia piece. Okay. Okay. I, uh, I noticed that our time is almost up. Uh, do you, how much time do you need to finish? Uh, uh, I mean, I have a couple. That's, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't have, uh, this is, this is pretty much it. Question. All right, then Did perhaps you? one last question. Okay. Eileen oh, oh Eileen, are you next? Okay. Uh, so uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, first of all, 25% of all of high school students with IEPs drop out now in Michigan. That was uh, that statistic came out. Michelle and I served on that um, <coughs> advisory board. 20% uh, of gifted and talented kids drop out nationally uh, because what we're doing in schools doesn't work for how they view life and they're ready to go on or they're just done. Um, your child pulled parents on mastery-based, competency-based learning and project-based learning and seed time, you know, learning 
by calendar time, uh, in December, of a thousand people questioned, all of whom had children um, who were in school. Uh, a 60, we, we gave them a choice of two or three um, uh, options, and 73% with, with only fewer than a quarter knowing what mastery learning was before we polled, 73% wanted mastery learning, 68% wanted project-based learning, and only 16% wanted to continue with calendar-based learning. And when we gave them all of the ways that you could show you were learning things, what you could do with it, after the entire poll was done, 96% of the parents wanted some or all aspects of mastery-based and project-based learning. So we, it's our role to be cautious. Um, we have to, we're, our role is supervisory, there's no question about it. But at the same time, we can't um, be afraid, so afraid of change that we block things that, are, that could work for children and do have the oversight with us and other entities that's needed. So I just wanted to throw that out for, for thought. Okay, and let's see. I yeah, just, um, sorry. So you, you uh, touched on the, my concern around um, uh, special ed kids and if they're included in this and, and things are adapted for them. So that, that's a thought I had. But I was also wondering, I noticed, uh, do you, are you working at all with the um, apprenticeship programs that labor unions provide for skilled trades? Because, you know, they have that apprentice, they get paid to be a student, yeah, yeah. and I didn't see them in the consortium language. Yeah, there. so um, the consortiums are kind of left wide open. So if a school wants to partner with a labor union to create a apprenticeship program, that would definitely be supported. Um, like I said, it's, it, we're asking schools, come to us with your ideas, and that would certainly uh, fit into this. Um, we're also looking to align some of the state's actions on apprenticeships already, like uh, the US DOL, um, I think it's like, is it certified apprenticeships or something like that? We're not that impressed with the federal apprenticeships right now because the requirements are really wonky and, and kind of strange. Um, but you can imagine a school creating, uh, partnering with labor unions, um, and the operating engineers are one of our huge champions for, for the Marshall Plan. But you can imagine a school partnering with them to create an apprenticeship program um, and using supports that we see here uh, to, to create that. And we would be completely and fully supportive. That's exactly the kind of stuff that, that we're looking for. Okay, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. Obviously, there's a great interest on the board, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more uh, as these programs develop. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right, the next item on the Committee of the Whole agenda is presentation on school safety. Um, I guess we're going to invite our folks to come in. I want to thank you all for waiting here. Uh, so we um, had a, a bathroom <laughs> casualty. Um, one of our personnel just ran downstairs real quick to the bathroom, but we can uh, uh, go ahead and get started. Um, uh, this is a, a presentation that the uh, board uh, requested on school safety, given the uh, recent tra tragic events in Parkland, uh, Florida, and other schools throughout our country. Um, it's renewed conversations around school safety, not only in our state, but nationally. Um, those conversations are starting on how to best keep students and staff safe at school um, and what are the many aspects that need to be considered um, to keep schools safe. Um, Superintendent Whiston convened a stakeholder group um, of educators and law enforcement and mental health professionals in our state in early March. There's a correlation of uh, education and law enforcement organizations that have also put forward uh, a plan around improving school safety in, in our state and Governor Snyder and, and his team is also working on uh, a proposal as well. So lots of conversation going on. I uh, thought it'd be good to have this conversation at the board table. So we've uh, asked our partners um, at State Police, um, who we work very closely with, um, as well as um, uh, Oak Ridge uh, School District to talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff they're doing, not only at the state perspective with State Police, but also um, at the local level. And Superintendent Livesy from Oak Ridge and, and his team that he brought with him will uh, come up shortly as well, but I'd like to first ask uh, Captain uh, Klinsky and uh, Nancy Becker Bennett from the state, Michigan State Police to join us and talk a little bit about the work that uh, they're doing with schools about uh, what we're doing collaboratively and uh, just start the conversation from there. Thanks, Kyle. And um, we just wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about what was done in the past because 
very soon. Uh, we'll probably have some additional direction for the future, but this goes back to October of 2003 when uh, then Captain Etchew, now Colonel Christy Kibbe Etchew, uh, allowed us to, one, identify schools as critical infrastructure. We were the first state in the nation uh, after 9-11 to say schools are, in fact, critical infrastructure. We designated them. That allowed us to provide over $8 million to schools from the Department of Homeland Security. And with that, the schools had to do certain things. Uh, one was do a vulnerability assessment. Take a look at their building. We provided a template for them to start doing the, the hardening of that school um, with this money, as well as they had to do an exercise. Back in the day, this is when chemical, biological, uh, radiological, nuclear, and explosive weapons were becoming more of an, uh, a concern of ours. Uh, so they had to update their emergency operations plans, their response plans to factor in that type of a, of a hazard. Um, and so that is where we kind of started really looking at schools to harden the schools. Uh, school security has always been an issue, but that's kind of when we kind of took some more steps and, and provided that much needed money to, to harden uh, the schools. Um, I won't get into the committee. Nancy may touch on that, but in July 2014, Governor Snyder presented the Michigan School Safety Guidance documents, and that included planning guidance, uh, emergency operations uh, plan template, which allowed schools to just go in if they didn't have one and just uh, basically put the school name in and it would populate the entire document. The planning guidance really instructed them how to bring uh, multidisciplinary teams together in order to make sure that they cover all their bases with that emergency operations plan template and then some classroom and office quick reference guides. And all this information was sent out to all the law enforcement agencies, local emergency management coordinators, as well as uh, all Michigan schools at that time. Um, and then I'm gonna just, before I get too much into that, have Nancy touch on maybe the, the committee and some of the things we did and some other grant funds that, that she was a part of. Um, so in 2013, uh, the governor asked for a school safety task force to be created, which it was. Um, it was a partnership between the state police and the Department of Education. And we had um, on that, it was very multidisciplinary. It was not a appointed task force, so there was a lot of people who came to different meetings. We had committees that included uh, the hotline, which ended up being the okay to say legislation. We had a prevention and mental health committee, a drills committee, which I think Captain Klinsky is going to talk about, the school safety response plan, which was updated, um, and then a training committee. Um, the committee was active, the overall task force was active for about 15 months. And one of the biggest things we did when we updated the emergency operations plan um, and then the following year in 2000, that was sent out to all schools um, and all law enforcement. And then in 2015 and 2017, the governor um, authorized funding to be used for school grants. Um, in 2015, we had $4 million that was given to us to um, give out to schools. We received um, 276 applications totaling over 46 million dollars in requests so we had a committee that got together and looked at all the applications and we decided to focus the funding on access control uh, panic buttons and smart 911 systems security doors and window film and then in 2017 um, we had grant funding also we had two million dollars that was given for this and we received 85 applications totaling over $4.6 million. Um, and out of that, 52 applicants were selected for a grant award. Um, and in, I'm sorry, in 2015, we had 87 applicants that were awarded the $4 million. Um, one of the mandates of receiving the grant funding was that the schools had to have an updated emergency operations plan. Of course, this was back in when it was updated was 2013, uh, 2014. So we're looking at um, doing more updates to that that we would then send out to the schools and ask them to follow suit. Um, and the, the, the schools have, um, they, I mean, they were great grantees of ours. There's been a lot of requests that we've received, again, lately for more assistance, more help. We have community service troopers around the state. There's at least one at every post, and those community service troopers 
um, help the schools. They have to do an assessment, a vulnerability assessment, to determine what types of equipment that they need. So the CSTs have been helping with that since that time. And going back to the uh, the eight million dollars that was uh, put out, I didn't hit on some numbers. Five hundred seventy one districts that included charters and academies. Uh, that incorporated 3,434 school buildings, and that was about 94% of all the eligible uh, buildings um, that were out there. So that was pretty successful back in then. It did create a foundation. Uh, knowing that our, our local police agencies, sheriff departments, uh, work with the school, some of them already had plans in place. The planning guidance isn't to replace that but it's to make sure they have all the components in it. It's not just response, it's not just ensuring EMS is there, but it's how are they handling access and functional needs? How are they handling security after hours? Uh, how are they handling uh, reunification sites and doing reunification? So that's what that guidance is. If they already had a plan, they could just cut and paste certain parts of it to add it to the plan. That's really the purpose of that. So it's not saying they have to use it, uh, at least with that one, um, that was just more the, the guidance. Um, uh, just recently, I think it was the end of February, uh, Colonel Etchew with the State Police did send a letter out to all the schools again, uh, reminding them to review, evaluate, and exercise their emergency operations plans, educate staff, parents, students, and community uh, members about their emergency operations plans, as well as post key information about the EOP and accessible locations in uh, their buildings. Um, going back to what Nancy said about the drills, uh, as a part of that group, Public Act 12 of 2014 updated those emergency drill requirements for schools. Uh, if you recall, there's a minimum of three drills where occupants are restricted to the interior of the building and the building secured, and it has to be posted 30 days uh, after the drill is completed. Um, there's really no mechanism in place to check on that. I can tell you just from me checking some of the schools, um, that I'm familiar with, some are good at posting it, some are not posting it at all. Um, and, and it's just something that we have to work through uh, maybe in uh, the next iterations of, of school safety. Um, but that change in Public Act 12 was put in place. Um, I think that's, unless there's anything else, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Kyle, anything you wanted us to touch on outside of that? Maybe just a little about the Homeland Security Conference and the, and the school oh, track right. stuff. Yeah, yeah. great, thanks. Um, so uh, our Homeland Security Conference, we have a school track. We've been doing this for years. Uh, we were giving um, we were giving 300 uh, or 100 seats in the past. We've increased it to 300. We're actually beyond 300 free seats for our educators. This also includes school resource officers. That's been pushed out to everybody. I don't know the number now. We're over 300. Um, I've been given some approvals to just keep going. I think there's 10 more days. I don't know if the school track has closed, but uh, we'll have a lot of educators. They'll be there with other local emergency managers and responders, but it's a separate school track. So while the responders are, are in other parts of the Great Lakes Homeland Security Conference at breakout sessions, there's just that one school track. Um, we've never had this number of people uh, attend. It's been very difficult sometimes getting some of the educators there, but um, We've had a great turnout, obviously, with everything going on. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, we have some funding to, to allow us to do that. And if anyone wants information, um, I can get it to uh, Kyle. Kyle may already have it, and he can send that or forward that to you. We have shared that with schools through our communication uh, our yeah. networks. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I, I don't know if you want to. We, we got a, um, a large group from Muskegon, so we can't all fit at the table, but they're going to hang around. So if you want to have Oak Ridge come up first, or if you want to ask questions of state police right now, we can do that, whatever. Other questions? Uh, Cassandra? Uh, I mean, oh, Eileen. Um, uh, I, I lived in a very secure situation. I had bomb proof walls and AK 47s because my husband was U.S. ambassador. Mm -hmm. So I, I continually forget that most people haven't had that abnormal um, focus in their life. Um, I wanted to ask, though, I recently, we have dogs that bark. My trainer said, put up film so the dogs can't see out. I was stunned to find when I started exploring it, the kinds of films that are available now for windows yeah. that can hold off anybody trying to get in, despite what they're throwing at it. We had RPG level glass and, at the embassy, but I know that it's almost to that point now for that's available on the market. Can I ask whether schools are required to do it for new construction and renovation, whether there's anything in the system 
that requires them to upgrade to a security level that um, is uh, going to make children more safe. I'm not aware of any codes. Mm -hmm. It's a discussion that's not only with school safety, but also with mitigation against other disasters and ensuring that when we do new construction, that these things are put in place. But I'm not aware of any codes right now that require like the glass to be embedded into the, the actual frame um, to, to harden it like you had talked about. Well, there's that, but the, the films literally go on the outside mm -hmm. and they can't be shot through. And, you know, you can't knock it out. You can't get into even do a, a door handle, which was, I had no idea. Uh, I don't know how expensive they are. I didn't go that far. And a couple of other really quick questions. A, a school in my community directed the teachers to, um, without crash bars on, on doors after the Florida shootings, to lock the doors when the kids were in the class and they had doorknobs and to not let anybody in or out for bathroom breaks for the duration of the class, which struck me as a real problem for safety violations. And I know that they resolved it. it you know, I don't have a child there, but I wondered how much of that is going on. And I also um, wondered, I've been reading on the internet how parents are really upset about the um, sort of the disappearance of their child's innocence in uh, elementary school drills. And I don't know if there's any way to mitigate that. I don't know whether we're in the first stages of trying to teach children how to be safe and we'll become more sophisticated <coughs> about how to do that. Um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on either of those. Well, from a drill standpoint, if, if we're not practicing, then we're really uh, already preparing to fail. Um, I recall, and I'm sure some in here recall, you know, doing duck and cover. Um, I, I think some may argue I turned out okay, but I mean, <laughs> that was just, that was part of it. Uh, whether it's a fire drill or duck and cover. Um, so it's, it's getting the, the normalization of preparing for all emergencies and disasters. That's, if we're not doing that, we, we are setting ourselves up to fail. And I mean, this is what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, dealing with emergencies and disasters. So, um, my wife's a teacher, uh, so I, I definitely understand the other side of it, but we definitely have to continue to, to drill and, and plan and train and work with our local emergency responders. And they have to see the local emergency responders. When they have a drill, local police, state police, um, EMS, fire, they should be there. Children should see that and, and be okay with it, not be traumatized by it. Yeah, uh, Cassandra? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> A couple quick questions. Uh, first of all, I, it sounds like a lot of the um, the funding available has been for infrastructure, which is absolutely vital and important. But what about the prevention of incidents, like training for behavioral intervention teams and things like that, to try to mitigate uh, what could potentially happen? Um, so the funding that we've had in the past definitely, like you said, was used for infrastructure and it was used to prevent people from even having access to the building. But in terms of state police, um, you know, we do have the community service troopers and they are trained in all sorts of things outside from what the normal troopers are trained in. Um, and they help with that. They go into the classrooms, they talk to the kids. We also have some curriculums. We have a team curriculum which is done. It's a lot of um, different lessons, but there's a lot of prevention in that. So in terms of the funding that we've had, it has not been used for prevention. Um, but in terms of a lot of the other resources that we've had, we've really focused a ton on prevention. Okay. Some of those funding streams, Cassandra, you know, come from Health and Human Services. They come right. from other, other places. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that it's enough, but there are other funding yeah. streams available to schools to help. Um, promote them and, and do the mental health, the bullying prevention work of it. It's just not housed. And, and I think it's important for the kids, but I also think it's important for the people who serve on those teams mm -hmm. to have that kind of training too, because I don't think that always happens. Um, the other question I had, I, I oversee crisis communication for a college, and right now we're in the process of doing an RFP for a new emergency messaging system, because the one we have isn't very good. And it occurs to me, you know, all of us use, there's only a handful of them that we typically use in the state, and yet we each have to sign a separate agreement, and it's extremely costly. Uh, is there any way that we can kind of at a state level create uh, an agreement that would allow us all to use a similar system at a reduced cost? So state contracts are always something people can tap into. Uh, we actually are waiting for um, 
our RFP to come back on a on some statewide systems, but we do have some statewide notification systems. But it, it may, the needs at the local level may be a little bit different. Technology is changing so rapidly. Um, but I would say definitely look at some of the state contracts that are out there um, to see if you can piggyback off of them. But there's probably three to five vendors, and, and it's right. really locally driven. Some may want, you know, this one versus another one, but there are some state contracts that are available. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> uh, Tom. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, uh, I had a question. I don't know, Kyle, if this presentation was uh, partially brought about by our uh, interaction uh, that I had with you, but I, I'm curious about the discretion that schools have when, uh, particularly in high schools, when there's assault. Um, you know, I know that there's there's got to be differences between, you know, somebody taking on the classroom bully in the, in the you know, um, playground or whatever, but what about assault? Um, do, do schools have the discretion to decide whether or not to call law enforcement? Um, is there, I know I'm concerned about, you know, school to prison pipelines and things like that. I, I don't want, you know, every, every small fight to be viewed as a, you know, misdemeanor or felony. But I do wonder if um, there could be discretion such that's given that somebody who really is a threat um, could be given a lot of leniency when they shouldn't be. I, I'm not aware of any requirements where schools have to report, but it's really about the victim and the victim's parents. If, if a child is assaulted and that victim wants to file charges with the local or state police, uh, they take the report and that's given to the prosecutor's office who determines whether or not any action is taken. But uh, the victim has the right to, to file a complaint anytime that they're uh, assaulted verbally or physically. Very good. Okay. It, I guess that's fine. I mean, I, I've, I've heard where uh, schools take matters into their own hands and they have ways of, you know, we've, we've actually passed uh, policy, uh, you know, advice, advice regarding how to deal with conflicts. But I, I just didn't know if sometimes that gets moved into the discretion of the school and kind of the oversight of the school or whether law enforcement wouldn't. Uh, give that discretion would actually get involved if there was some kind of report or I, yeah, I just am trying to figure out where the line is there. I think uh, our uh, manager of our, our school health unit, Amy Alanese, might have something to, to. So also the statewide school safety information policy. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. So also the statewide school safety information policy contains a list of reportable incidents that are required to be reported to law enforcement. Um, and that is part of the response guide. We also worked with the Michigan State Police in creating that so that it is in alignment to the documents we provided through the emergency operations guides as well. But it does list all of the types of incidents and physical assault is one of those incidents. Um, it is up to the discretion of the school district if it is a you know playground bully thing as you referenced versus an actual assault on another student. If they, dis the, if they disertain that it is an actual assault on another student, then that is one of the things that are listed to be reported to local law enforcement. Thank you. You're welcome. Pam? So uh, my question, I, you know, when we talk about school safety, all, our minds go in totally different directions um, because of different experiences. So. Um, you brought up the uh, school resource officers, and I want to know a little bit more about how are they trained, how are, you, how are we ensuring that uh, we have the right officers that are showing up in the schools, how are we improving the relationship between the students um, and uh, policing, how are we making sure that we're not having any of the incidents that we've seen on TV where we've had school resource officers uh, treating students um, in an insensitive way. So what are, are some of the things that, that we're doing around that? And I think Tom, it was Tom that mentioned the school to prison pipeline because there are a lot of parents who go to schools, they see officers in those schools and they, their, their minds go in a, may go in a different direction around safety. Yeah, I think we have to change that perception of seeing police fire anyone in uniform in a school should be, we need to flip that narrative. 
Um, as far as the school resource officers, I, I would probably look to Chief Gale or, or uh, Sheriff Poulin to maybe provide more on that, unless Nancy, I mean, we have our community service troopers, but I think when you talk about a school resource officer, um, most of the time, I think it's at the local local level they provide that. Nancy? Right. Yeah, the school, the state police does not have any school resource officers because, again, those would be local law enforcement. Um, currently, the state of Michigan does not have any guidelines for to be a school resource officer. You need, you know, A to Z. Um, but it's something that we are working on. Okay. And then, I, because I thought, I mean, heard you mention that there's training for School. And so I guess would that be incorporated into the training? That type? Yeah, that's the Great Lakes Homeland Security Training okay. Conference. So yeah. we wanted to make sure that we had school resource officers with okay. the educators at this training. Um, so that's why we provided some funding for the school resource officers at the local level as well. Michelle? Um, yeah, it, it, my, um, my question is related to what um, Pam just said. Um, I know under the, um, the, the there was some uh, legislation around restraint and seclusion, um, and that there was legislation that was passed that opted the uh, police officers out of the training that was required uh, around that. So the restraint and seclusion was with regard, even though the, it came out of um, a task force dealing with special ed kids, um, and it applies to any... Um, anytime there's a need for restraint or seclusion. Um, but there's um, key people who are supposed to be trained on how to properly restrain and seclude. And also, um, as a mother of a child with autism, um, and I get on these, you know, these uh, listservs, every day I hear of a child um, with autism because they don't respond in a predictable <coughs> way, getting shot, getting killed because they're misunderstood. They don't follow direction very well. They don't process through uh, voice very well. So um, I would, so these guidelines for the school uh, reform officers, I think, um, I, I think is really critical. And I think it should include, because one of the, ar one of the arguments at the, for this, passing this legislation to opt out is that all these officers, are all, they're all trained in everything around that. And I don't think that's the truth. I think there are some that may be, and many that are not. And um, so I think uh, I, I just would urge in, in that uh, in that situation that there be uh, a training around dealing with kids with mental health. I also would like to suggest that um, I um, hate to repeat this again, but I you know I'm I'm. Um, mother of 18 children, and many of them have all, from all different walks of life as a foster parent, adoptive parent, and I've had some kids with some severe uh, mental health issues, and um, there are no resources that I could find when I desperately needed that. I, mean, I talk to parents all the time, and, um, you know, I know um, I have a sister and a pediatric nurse in Newtown, Connecticut, and um, and the, the woman who... Um, you know, Adam Lanza, who, who killed all those kids, she was desperately looking for help. And there's a stigma, and there's no resources. So there's just, um, I think parents are the first to know when there's trouble brewing, and it's usually at home. And, uh, they're, you know, it's kind of like you're left on your own to deal with it, and our insurance and all the inadequate <laughs> uh, so resources we have, um, I think, that there really does need to be um, some serious recognition of that problem and um, outreach to parents um, so it's not just, report, you know, someone to help them um, deal with their kids' behaviors without arresting them or um, criminalizing them, but giving them the support they need. So that I, that I just wanted to put that out there. Very good. No other questions? Okay, continue. Great, thank you. On um, at this point, um, uh, Captain Kowalski and, and Nancy hang around uh, for the rest of the conversation. But I'm going to ask uh, Superintendent Livesey for all control of the schools and his team to come on up again up chairs for everybody on their team. And uh, you had yeah, go ahead and also. And um, uh, we had some handouts passed out earlier that uh, he and his uh, folks wanted to share, and I'll let him introduce him and his team. Great. 
Well, thank you for inviting us to, to be here with you today and, and encouraging for me to have the State Board of Ed want to hear from a local district. And this is a topic that's really important to me. Um, five years ago, our Board of Education established a new mission statement in our strategic planning process, and they added two words to it that weren't there before. And the words were uh, safe and healthy. So our mission statement is all kids safe and healthy, college and workplace prepared. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. So before we dig in, I'd like to introduce our, our team here. Uh, John, Dr. John Severson, Superintendent from Muskegon ISD. Uh, Chief John Gale from Norton Shores uh, Police and Muskegon County Sheriff Michael Poulin. So uh, before jumping in, I'd uh, give you at least a little bit of perspective about Oak Ridge Public Schools. We're on the uh, rural urban fringe of Muskegon County. We're about 2,000 students, bordering 70% free and reduced lunch rate, so you can get a little bit of uh, demographic perspective there. Um, about 220 uh, employees. Uh, about Four years ago, Muskegon County collaborated on a countywide regional enhancement millage specifically focused on technology and security. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the presentation, but we have some funding on a regional basis in Muskegon County to help us out with some of our efforts. So uh, as we dig in here, what I hope to accomplish today at the end of the presentation is to describe what we call a balanced approach to school safety. And I have a dozen things that I put in a brochure that looks like this. That was a handout, and we're going to cover those 12 things. By no means are these 12 things everything that we do. There are more that we can be doing for school safety, uh, things that we are doing that are not on the list, and those additional things that we could be doing. So arguably the most important facet of our school safety program is our approach called the whole child model. Whole child model, and if you look at the research, and I'll make a statement here that research has proven to be true, and that statement is kids who genuinely feel safe, healthy, engaged, supported, and challenged do well in school, and they don't turn violent. So that's the focus of our whole child model, is we need to be looking at nurturing the entire child, from the emotional aspect to the physical aspect, uh, making sure that they feel belong, they belong to our school. We have a number of programs in our district, uh, depending on the, the levels, a program called Capturing Kids' Hearts with a relational-based program. We have Teens United, which focuses on inclusiveness. We have Link Crew, which we link upperclassmen with entry-level freshmen to make sure that they make that a, a venture into high school. Uh, as belonging as they, they can become. Uh, we have Watchdog Dads. DOG stands for Dads of Great Students, where the dads come in and volunteer just to be in the school, just to build relationships with kids and be a male role model in our schools. Uh, uh, we have Empowered Kids, where people just volunteer to be part, and they spend one hour with a kid every single week, and we identify kids in need who have things that they're struggling with, emotionally, physically, academically, and they just spend an hour with them. I personally, Kids Hope is another one that operates like that, and I personally participate as a Kids Hope mentor. Every hour, every Thursday morning at 8 o'clock, I spend an hour with Carlos, and Carlos just uh, uh, means a lot to me, and we just spend that one hour talking about what's going on in his life. So with the whole child model, I think that's got to be a, a strong aspect of any school safety program is focusing on uh, the relationships that you have with kids. But that's not enough that in and of itself. Uh, we've established the Oak Ridge Wellness Network over the last several years. Uh, in fact, there's another brochure that goes into great detail about the Oak Ridge Wellness Network. We have some key wraparound services. It's great to have adults that just are willing to volunteer their time, but there's issues that kids have in their homes and their relationships that need specialty services and professionals that are uh, skilled in uh, helping them to, with some of their needs. Uh, we have uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services have a Pathways to Potential office get right inside of our middle school. Our middle school and high school are, is one campus, so it's a thousand kids that can literally walk down the hall to both our Teen Health Center, which I'll cover next, and our Pathways Potential office. Families are going in and out of that uh, uh, facility. 
Uh, they could be ranging from food assistance, daycare needs, utilities, to getting them turned back on, transportation, maybe they don't have a car or a way to get to work, uh, clothing, medical needs, and even mental health. And so with these key uh, partners that we have right inside our schools, our Board of Education, our Board President is here today to support me on this, we feel it's so important to have those people on site so that we have immediate access. Uh, to those right on site. So the, this Oak Ridge Wellness Network, um, and I'd be happy to delve into questions on the topic, but uh, multi-tiered uh, services is a key part, and the very first page talks about how this integrates with the operations that we have in our building, and it's not an, an other thing. It's just a fabric of what we do and how we integrate it with our student support systems in our district. Uh, number three is our Teen Health Center. Our kids can literally walk down the hall to see a doctor, a dentist, and a mental health professional. There is, uh, there's a lot of school-based health centers in the state. I don't think that there's enough, but um, uh, Deb Brinson is uh, Association Director for the School Community Health Alliance and here to support that. And the CEO of Hackley Community Care who operates our teen health center, Linda Juarez, is here in the audience today as well. Um, we feel that this is a critical need. Our kids, our zip code, 49442, has the highest charity care in uh, their service provider area, expands outside of the Muskegon County region. Our zip code has the highest charity care in the hospital's emergency room because they didn't have access to the care. It was 30 minutes to drive downtown to get care. We did not have, until our teen health center, we did not have a single doctor a single dentist in our school district. So our kids just simply didn't have access to the care. So five years ago, it was my personal mission. Just flippantly said one day, we're gonna bring a health center to Oak Ridge. It's a long story on how that happened, but we're really fortunate that our kids can do that. Our attendance rates have improved dramatically. Where kids had to take an entire day off or their parents had to get off of work to pick them up go 30 minutes downtown, come back, and by the time they don't ever come back to school. So now they're going to the dentist, getting their teeth cleaned. In 20 minutes, they're back in class. So that does help attendance. You gotta be here to learn here, is what we say. And so attendance is really important. That's a key factor of our teen health center. Uh, so those foundational things with uh, uh, focusing on the safety, healthy, students engaged, support and challenge, that's what I feel is the foundation to all of our efforts. I'd like to allow a few minutes for our law enforcement to talk about our emergency responder partnerships. Now, let Chief uh, Mike Poulin take over from there. Okay. Uh, again, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for the invite here. Um, really, what I want to touch base on is uh, uh, what my agency, the Sheriff's Office, has been doing collaboratively with other law enforcement agencies throughout Muskegon County. Uh, with the school districts in our area. Um, we have all together, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we have 12 school districts that do not include uh, charter or private schools also uh, from there. But, um, and the things that we specifically have been doing at Oak Ridge, um, the successes we've had there. Uh, our public safety community with the Muskegon County has been proactively attending and offering professional assistance to local school districts on how to better prepare for potentially dangerous and catastrophic events. Um, as a sheriff, uh, I'm quite proud to announce that Muskegon County is only one of the 83 counties in the state of Michigan that since 2013 has a countywide lockdown policy. All right, this is a policy that's uh, been accepted by the ISD and it's followed and used by all the districts within Muskegon County. Um, this, uh, this policy was kind of driven on the idea, um, we, we saw, I think everybody's well aware that after Columbine, um, the response of law enforcement really changed. Um, from there, uh, law enforcement was receiving training from the Michigan State Police. Uh, they called it quad training, where there before three officers entering a building if there's an incident going on. And we all can agree that that's no longer acceptable. And what we see today is a single officer entry if needed. Um, but during that time of the quad training, I could have came from West Michigan, met an officer out of the Detroit area, and we could have been in the UP on vacation and an incident could have happened there. And when that incident did, the three of us could have responded with an officer from the UP and acted accordingly and acted the same way. But what we were finding was that the districts were not responding the same way. And it was uh, pretty important. 
um, that uh, when law enforcement was showing up to these districts, that we had an idea of what to expect. Um, and so that was pretty much how that was driven from there. Um, my office has and will continue to work with any requesting districts, perform security assessments, and respond to any appropriate training needs. Um, I've made myself available, um, much like I did with the Oak Ridge School District, uh, their facilities and administrative staff, and together we've worked uh, to improve school safety, doing assessments in all of their buildings, and doing this um, to maintain that uh, academic climate for the students at that time, uh, to get them to do what, they're, what they need to be doing. Together we work to help to improve school security. Uh, these assessments and trainings have included written suggestions to improve school security as well as tabletop exercises and drills. Our collaborative effort has been accomplished by partnerships with the school districts, area law enforcement, and first responders uh, from the area, both our fire departments and EMS together. Um, we've come up with a, a, what I think is a great plan. Um, we're doing some great things in Muskegon County. Um, and I don't know if you're going to Chief Gale now. Yes. To talk about the uh, operations plan. Thank okay. you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Tom and the Oak Ridge School District uh, for inviting me. Um, they are a great example for a school district. Uh, they lead the way in school safety and I've uh, been very impressed with seeing all that they've done and as you'll see today. Uh, Captain Kalinske touched on the area I was already going to talk about or I was asked to bring in, so thank you, Captain. <laughs> um, school policies um, in Muskegon County, we found that much like our lockdown policies, school districts had different policies. Some were outdated, some were up to date, but they were all different throughout the county. Um, so we decided with the, the leadership of Dr. Severson, um, bring us together, law enforcement, first responders, and all the school superintendents to come together to create one document, much like we did with the lockdown policy, and to make sure that they're responding the same way so law enforcement knows how to respond, much like the lockdown policy, where we assist each other. We need to know what that policy is, and if they're the same throughout the district, then we know what that is, instead of one being different than another. Um, what that did is brought all the superintendents, the first responders together for about a six month period of putting this policy together. And we learned weaknesses that we could work together throughout the county, what we needed to work on. And we came up with this document in the end that was approved not only by the state police, FEMA, all the different groups to make sure it was within that template that was offered by the state and federal um, agencies. Um, from there though, the important thing is, and we have a meeting coming up this month, is not only do you have a policy, but you have to update the, that policy because it is a working document. You have to revisit that annually and train to that annually. You can't just throw out this document and a lot of times the teachers are throwing it aside not really ever looking at it. You have to train to that document and that's what we're doing in Muskegon County. And also that update from year to year. We have that meeting coming up this month. So. So that's kind of what's going on as far as the policy. I, like you said, I had, I had more to say about policies, but it's already been discussed, so I won't waste your time. But, but we have done that in Muskegon County and every school district is up to date on their policies. What I'll add to the law enforcement, I mean, I went to school to teach children and my expertise was not in security. So having to get myself up to speed, the partnership is critical. Uh, it took me several years to get our emergency operations plan updated and distributed to 200 employees. But knowing that it was literally written detail by detail that we update annually by law, uh, with law enforcement's help, is just uh, comforting for us that we know we've got the right practices and procedures in place. I'd also like to expand on one of the most uh, eye-opening experiences that I've had with that is actually doing the tabletop exercises where we sit as an administrative team with law enforcement and they throw a scenario <clears throat> at, at you. There's a gas plume over the lower elementary at exit 10. What are you going to do? And then on the spot, we have to think about the steps and procedures. And they're that right there telling you, you forgot this, you forgot this. So we're actually going through these as if it's real time in this tabletop exercise. And then trying to take those administrators and try to duplicate those in real exercises in the buildings, knowing that we've got research based aligned with law enforcement practices that are going on in our schools. 
Um, with that said, I want to, to kick it off to Dr. Severson and talk about some of the technology that we use uh, called Navigate Prepared. Well, thanks, Tom. And just to echo uh, what our law enforcement has said, uh, Tom's been great in this work, um, and all of our districts are collaborating. So it's really important to know that this is a very intense collabor uh, collaboration that we're trying to move everybody. So some people might not get pieces of this very well, and we're trying to expand that knowledge. I think all of us went in to be teachers and educators, so this is kind of a new frontier. But it's great that we have law enforcement at the table on a number of these issues. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about, uh, it's called Navigate. Um, Navigate is a system, it's a technology system, that allows us to virtually have everything on a phone. So I have all my... Uh, flip charts, I have my policies, I have my call list, I have my processes of what I should be thinking about, all the things that I need to touch on, right by my phone or on my desktop or my administrative team. And when we were going through all of these policies, what came out of it was, you know, every summer, all of you should know this, we have to update that red folder. And take the red folders back, you, you're shaking your head yes, right? All of them come back, did we get them all? Okay, update the files, we're doing all that stuff. In this system, we update something, it hits all of those. There's no need to have that paper trail. Now, you could still have a hard copy if you need to have that, but what's nice is while I'm in Lansing, when I leave this meeting, if there is an emergency, I can pull over, access everything right here. I can walk through my whole team what's going on. But the other thing that Navigate has is um, you can post your drills automatically so we're covered with the state. You could post them on your website. You could post the time. All of your drills could be taken care of like that. That's a big feature. I can also see where in my building are shutoff valves, gas, electric, all the power grids. And law enforcement has access to all of those. They could see our whole building. So when Navigate comes in, they take uh, photos of every room, 360 degree photo of every room. That's part of what the project costs. And what's real nice about that is no matter where you're at or if law enforcement needs access, they can access it on the fly. That's, that's a real game changer for us in safety. Instead of, okay, where are, your, where are your plans? Let's lay them out. Let's figure out where everything's at. And as a superintendent, I like to know where all my defibrillators are so I could check them. It's those kinds of simple things that are, that are checked off. I think the biggest piece, though, of the Navigate that came out of this was when we update a policy, we make sure we're accurate by the professionals who tell us yes, and we're learning at the same time. We all want to be better. So on April 30th, we're going to have another summit. We're bringing in everybody. We've got all the charters coming. The private schools are coming in our county. There's 16 total. So my goal as an ISD is to help collaborate to get all of this out so we're more prepared as, as a county for all of our children. So that will, that will be taking place. But I think if you look at, um, this is one tool, we've been really impressed with it. We're gonna bring them back to show the others what we were able to do. We were the innovators. We were the first um, Oak Ridge, our ISD, and a little district called Holton uh, took off on that. And so we're gonna, we proved it's a good <clears throat> tool and we're gonna let the others see it as well. Thanks, and having ISD leadership on this as a local district is, I really appreciate that because it kind of evens the playing field across uh, the county to, to have that kind of support. So I'd like to delve into uh, safe and secure facilities now. So, May, yes. Yes. Pose a question. Actually, yeah. you might be answering this question <laughs> now. Uh, do you guys have video cameras in your class? That's exactly what I'm going to cover. Okay. Exactly. So, <laughs> um, so here's some things about our facilities that we've done to uh, law enforcement calls that harden their facilities, but I'm just trying to make sure that we've got safe and secure uh, facilities. Um, some of the things, every one of our buildings over the last five years has been upgraded to have a single secure point of entry. Our middle school, you literally had to walk in the door, walk down the hall to get to the office, and we had no idea who was walking down the hall at that point. So we literally swapped the, a classroom with the office and uh, did that kind of construction. Um, we have surveillance cameras in, uh, throughout all of our facilities, including on every one of our school buses. That we'll be using some of our enhancement millage money to replace our school bus because um, kids know where the <laughs> blind spots are. <laughs> um, so that, that's going to be a huge help. Um, we've partnered with our local fire chief uh, who fell sick today, wasn't able to join us, but 
We now have Knox boxes on the front of every one of our buildings. So a Knox box is when you, only law enforcement has a key to open the Knox box to get to a master key for the entire facility. So they can get into every single room in our, our school district. So when we're in central command, we've got this navigate uh, prepared technology. I can bring up the 360 images and they can see where all the egress entries and exits are, where the gas shutoffs are. Then we can make a plan to get into the building and fix whatever emergency that, that we're doing on. So those Knox boxes are really important for us. And that wouldn't have been possible if we didn't rekey the entire district. So we have, I have literally one grand master key now uh, to get into every single room in the district. And there's only two of those in the district, facilities guy and myself. Um, so um, we also have key fob, keyless entries. So every one of our employees have uh, uh, electronic key fob. So we know who's going in and of our buildings at what times. And we even use that in, as a check-in and check-out uh, for time clocks uh, occasionally for some employee groups to be able to check in when they get to work in, in the morning. Um, Yeah, those are a few of the things. We can certainly do some more with, with facilities, but those are just a few of the examples that we do with our facilities to make sure that they're safe and secure and we're protecting them from outside intruders. There's certainly more we could do. Our conversations about our windows, our secretaries who are the first one anybody comes in to the secure entries and they're looking for um, shatterproof windows. And so it's a fair question coming from the secretary since they're the first line of sight for anything that, that happens with that. So I'd like to transition into Alice training. I'm fortunate to have our school board vice president, who is director of security at Mercy Health Hospital, and is certified in, uh, with the Alice Institute. And Alice stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. So every one of our employees this spring is going through Alice training. It's active intruder uh, training. So what do you do when there's an intruder in your schools and how do you respond? And that's really eye-opening. I've gone through my second one this morning. We did our upper L. We did our middle school and high school this morning. Um, so this is one of the top active shooter training uh, processes in the country from what I'm told. And it's really helped open our teachers' eyes and have them hear straight from me that, you know, when we do a lockdown, it's not, we're not just doing a lockdown. You have to think about what's happening. Uh, throughout the training, it talks about if uh, an intruder were to come in and you just lock down, well, that's when more lives are actually lost. If you're on the far end of the building and somebody makes an announcement that we have an intruder, perhaps the better thing to do is to leave the school and get out of there. And if the window's not working, you need to break the window to get out of the building. And so all the research and all of these uh, columbines and uh, Florida, the law enforcement goes in there and studies what happens, and that's what the more things we can do to prepare teachers and staff to respond to what information that they are reacting to versus just a rote lockdown. Sometimes lockdown is the best and only option, but sometimes evacuate is the better option, and sometimes you got to fight to get out of that situation, and we want to empower and train our staff to do that. We actually do real live exercises to do that uh, with our staff. So training is, is critical uh, with that. Quick question before you move on yeah. to that. Um, so for your cameras, do you have access to tap into their cameras if need be? We can. You can, okay. Has there been any conversations, I know some school districts have had um, conversations about, um, and this might be before, but not wanting that to happen because for various privacy issues or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, has that pretty much gone away at this point? Well, since it's kind of elevated as concern, I mean, yeah, the privacy issues of um, somebody looking over your shoulder all day, every day, I mean, the concern of that is, is certainly out there. But I think, I mean, I'm telling you my opinion uh, on this thing, I think that would probably dramatically decline because we want more eyes on school safety. The, the more eyes, the more information out there, the better. Um, I even, I mean, literally this morning, I had a teacher ask, uh, we want to see what's going on in the cameras. So um, not sure if we're going to go there or not, but um, those are the kinds of requests is that they want more eyes looking through that camera to see what's going on. So I would think more eyes, the better. 
Um, with that said, and still on the topic of training, uh, we have a tool called Safe Schools uh, by Vector Solutions. Safe Schools is an online training system, hundreds of videos, and so we do our bloodborne pathogen training, we do our um, secure, um, uh, so restraint uh, training, seclusion restraint training with that. Uh, Troon Law Firm helped develop that. And we put that in the Safe Schools uh, module. Uh, we can do it on HR issues. We can do it on um, uh, with our custodians, making sure they're following good practices. So Safe Schools is just a way to make, not just with intruders or things like that, but actually making sure your env environment, you have fewer workman's count claims. Uh, so it's just a more efficient way to get the training out there that we utilize that online training system to uh, help uh, with some of that. Um, getting trainers to do some of these type of trainers are very expensive, so this is a very cost-effective way to use a certified person to get that content out there. And staff can do it on their own time um, when it's convenient for them. So it's a, a nice convenience thing too. Um, number 10, okay to say. That is integrated into the fabric of what we do. We have, re uh, have received tips from OK to Say so through the um, Attorney General's Office and uh, State Police have uh, been a part in that uh, as well. Um, kids, staff, community, they can text, email, um, call a trained technician on the other end to report anonymously some type of tip that's going on related to school safety. We get those tips, we investigate those in partnership with law enforcement, and it provides a very easy way. Um, we do discourage Facebook tips. Um, we encourage them to follow the okay to say, uh, but we still have to respond to any tip from any source that we get, and so we're doing the best we can to um, investigate all issues that happen, but we're a big endorser of OK to Say, and it has led to us reacting to situations and preventing issues through that anonymous tip uh, system. Um, and finally, I'm going to tip it back over to D Dr. Sievison on some Muskegon wide partnerships that we have. So there were a few questions on mental health, and we know that is another factor. I think Tom did a is doing a great job with the whole child approach and they're getting great results. Um, one of the things that we've really worked hard uh, to do in our county is collaborate with Mercy Health and Health West. And Health West is our driver for mental health. And I, I heard one of you talk about that student crisis. So right now we're working on a mobilization crisis unit that will go to the school. So sometimes in these events they're going after an event has happened or at the family's home and they don't get the whole story. So this is a more of a, a, a group approach to solving that problem. We're also involved in systems of care grant. We're in seven, going to be seven school districts where we have people on site working. But as all of this is so uh, complex, the, the best part I've learned about uh, in this work is that we have to make all our staff stronger. So adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, has really impact our county. Uh, nationally, students have four or more ACEs. Our families, it's about 14%. Uh, in Muskegon County, we're over 30% that have four or more. So an ACE might be a, a parent incarcerated, uh, physical, sexual abuse, those types of really heavy trauma events. And recognizing that we're bringing in experts to work with uh, um, staff to understand how trauma impacts the brain. So in the last year, we've had about 120, no, uh, 1,200. Um, staff members trained on ACEs and some ways that they can cope with it themselves, but also how to help students. I, I guess the biggest part of, of what we need to do is at the same time securing our buildings, having navigate, having all these pieces. We have to have these really good relationships with our kids and our families. We have to engage with those families. So systems of care, great opportunity to do that. Um, mobile crisis units have to be there. But at the same time, we have to train our staffs to be better understanding of, of trauma and how that impacts the brain, but also how we can be a little bit more uh, understanding and also a quicker response to help those children. So a lot of the things I've learned has been from an experience of working in, in uh, at-risk populations, and so much of this is the relationship and what the school can do. And, and what Tom talked about today 
But that whole child is, is the biggest piece of this. Uh, we can put cameras everywhere, but if we don't have those relationships and we don't see things that are happening, we could still have more problems. Uh, lastly, you got a copy. We're very fortunate in our county to have a uh, tech security uh, millage. And if you look within there, you can see where people have spent money, about $160 per student per year. Um, and districts are in different places, but I wanted to share in regards to technology and security, the uh, tech directors meet and they talk about these processes. So what, one thing that I'm starting to see is um, architects are becoming more educated. Uh, what are those best practices? What are those entrances? What should they look like? They're having more conversations with law enforcement. So I think we've learned a lot in the last few years, but what I'm really um, pleased to see is the superintendents work very closely when they are going through <coughs> building projects talking about those enhancements, some of the things that they've done. You got bus cameras? Yeah, we have bus cameras. You know, how, how are the power drives working on those because of the bumpy roads, right? How, do you, how are you dealing with these kinds of things? They have those conversations. And I think when you heard the scenario conversation, these other conversations are taking place. So if you just have a chance to look at this, this is a report that we give to the community. Um, we do it every year just to uh, thank our community for supporting us. and. Um, we're pretty fortunate as a, as a uh, county to have this type of millage, but our uh, community supports it and they recognize that we have to have safe and secure environments and also uh, good technology in front of our kids. Uh, just a, one more point to add. So we literally just talked about this in our countywide superintendent's meeting on Monday. And um, we, call, we talked about rising tide raises all boats. And so within Muskegon County, we have Oak Ridge, who has the lowest taxable value per pupil in the county. And we have Whitehall, same size district, 2,000 kids, has two and a half times more taxable value per pupil. So when they go off for millage money, they can earn two and a half times more money. They have much nicer facilities than we do, but what we view this as the great equalizer. So they're, they're, we call ourselves donor districts to hire more affluent communities, donate essentially money to the lower taxable value. So I can't be proud of being on the bottom of, of the taxable value. I'm very encouraged to have colleagues, 12 colleagues, think that this regional enhancement village is the best way to go because it helps everybody, and including the districts like Oak Ridge, because we could only generate $180,000 with one mill on our district where this regional enhancement millage, we get 350. That's a huge difference and a great equalizer for the haves and the haves nots. Uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just mention that. So I'd like to conclude. So hopefully we've accomplished our goal of giving you a balanced approach. Relationships are critical, staff training, our facilities are, are a great uh, point. Our, our partnerships with both our mental health and medical and, um, other things, and then law enforcement. Uh, so with all that said, I'm going to let uh, Sheriff Pullen make some closing statements. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll go for questions. Um, and as, this, as we wrap this up, and pretty much everything we've talked about here, um, I think reflects um, what we've heard recently through the uh, recently announced Michigan School Safety Reform Plan uh, through the Michigan Sheriff's Association, Prosecutor Attorney Association, uh, uh, Chiefs of Police, and some other organizations put together. and just. You know, not to address too much on that, but hit those bulleted points so we understand and really identify that we're still talking about some of those same things. And one is more resource officers working within our school districts. Additional school mental health professionals uh, identify problems, much like the intercepts that we're doing in law enforcement. Ensuring safer school buildings by requiring assessments, all right, and using that information to allow districts to apply for grants. And lastly, mandatory reporting for threats uh, with graduated penalties to help prevent violence before it happens. Uh, helping to create that awareness and that vigilance throughout the districts. That's really all I have from there. Uh, Chief? Oh, wait, wait for qu any questions? Have they entertained any, any questions? Any questions? Eileen? Eileen? This is fabulous. Thank you so much for this presentation. And I, the, uh, the, uh, the Oak Ridge brochure um, is, a, is a case study of how to do so many things right from uh, uh, multi-tier systems of support through the health provisions. 
My question is that besides the security um, effort that you've undertaken, which is why you're here, I want to ask a couple of questions. One is, what is the foundation grant? In other words, if we are looking at uh, separating out what um, this school has done from what the district uh, can provide for uh, technology and, and uh, security through the millage, how does your school afford all of these different services? I, under, I understand and appreciate that when you convert the culture to supporting families and safety for children, that you then have money, and MTSS, MT, yes, SS, you then have money that you can apply elsewhere, but it still seems to me that what you've undertaken at Oak Ridge is extraordinary. And I just wondered whether there are federal, state grants available. I, I heard uh, uh, the uh, assistance of care grant. I don't know if that's private. Besides the millage, how are you financing it? Is most of it foundation grant, or is some of it? So I'll answer that from a local district perspective. And um, so I have a board president here, and I can tell you that not a single one of our community partners that we have cost Oak Ridge any money. We went for a grant for our school-based health center in partnership with Hackley Community Care, and that's funded through the state general fund. Um, and they will much better answer that question than I, but that's to operate it. We had to do our, our local um, fundraising efforts. And the contingent for that grant was you, we had to uh, generate a half million dollars to construct a 3,600 square foot health center, three dental operatories, three medical exam rooms, and a mental health office. And it is state of the art, but that required a lot of fundraising to, to build it. So we want to clone your board president, is what you're saying. Um, well, there was much more than just the board president, but uh, there was a huge amount of partners, companies, mm -hmm. foundations. It took a lot of work. I mean, Linda Juarez is here today, and she could tell much more of that story because she was instrumental on her team by making that happen. Um, facilities, we've got the regional enhancement knowledge. So those things don't come from our general fund. So not every county has a regional enhancement knowledge. Um, Law enforcement partnerships don't cost us any money. It's time, effort. Um, but having said that, we have at-risk funds. Uh, I have utilized some of my at-risk funds to contract with Hackley Community Care to hire an additional mental <coughs> health professional because the one that they had, in fact, the two that they now have due to us uh, co contracting that service, it's still not enough. Um, so we've certainly had to be creative because it's just not there in the foundation allowance. So, and I talked mm -hmm. to you about the discrepancy and what our taxable value is. Our facilities, we went for two bonds and they failed. We can't afford it. So, you know, we're having to be as creative as possible. It's not easy to sell millages, and the vision behind this one was extraordinary. I commend you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I think one thing, too, to share is uh, working with Health West on the mental health end. Um, we've not added any money in there. We've been really just how can we do things maybe differently and be more collaborative. A lot of the issues are there are a number of these silos in the system so don't all interact real well. So <clears throat> they're at the table. We're working together. So there's another, it's called SISM. We have people trained when there's a critical incident that takes place. It's a stress management system. So we've had over 100 people trained in our county. So if a school uh, has a severe case or something that happens, we can have a team that can go in that's been trained to do that. Um, you know, I think a lot of this, too, is as an ISD, we look at it as we, we can't wait for things either. Um, I, my role has been how can we collaborate? How can we lead? We know what the data is. We can't wait for somebody to bring it. So we've really just stepped it up on where we can. And um, when I talk to my staff, I talk to them about, you know, you could actually save a life. This is how this job has become. And we have kids that are really struggling out there, the things that we do. So when you go to Oak Ridge, you need to own their data. You need to do, you're doing PBIS training, you need to own that. So that those kids are our kids at the same time. And I think what's happened is that's helped us get even better on the focus. If you look at the Oak Ridge uh, pamphlet there at that front, the, that's an AC, ASCD uh, best practices, and now in the blue, we're taking all those areas and making sure, okay, strategically doing, what are people doing out of those areas? What is community doing, those resources? How do they fill in? Where is uh, law enforcement fit in? And then where are the voids? And then we're looking at all the districts 
we're going to do a run on who's got what and who needs more support. So as ISD, we're looking at how can we learn at the same time, lead, and give the best resources to everybody. We're, we're lucky to have, there, there are some other districts, but Oak Ridge has really put some nice things together. That clinic, if every school had that, or, or even nurses, it'd be huge in the state because we know if kids are well, uh, healthy, feel better about school, they're gonna be in school. Um, so I think there are a lot of really good things going on with the mental health aspect. Even though we're talking about school safety, that is part of school safety. And we, we get that. Eileen, if I could add a point to your funding thing, I'm just encouraging um, you to look into. Could you speak up because one of our members is on the cell phone. Oh, sure, the phone. Sure. Sorry. Um, I, there are, I do have a colleague here, Deb Brinson is here, and she is an expert in some of the funding sources that are making some of these things possible and ways to strategically use some funding to get some federal matching. Um, I'm not the expert, but I know that those are things that we've done that have benefited Oak Ridge, and that's why some of these things have been uh, put into place. I mean, it starts with a, a local board having a vision, and their vision was all kids safe and healthy, college and workplace prepared, and we've been really focused on that. And some of these other things have taken effort, but fallen into place rather nicely. Pam Pugh. So in the um, system of care is, is funded through SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Authority, which is a, a really good funding source. And really happy to hear that you all are integrating all of these things together. And just um, to my earlier question, and uh, Michelle brought up the mental health issues and obviously the trauma being trauma informed is really great but also the cultural sensitivity and cultural uh, you know better understanding the different cultures and, and so that those relationships um, are improved uh, um, between community and you said uh, enhancing the staff uh, really happy to hear that so um, just reminding of that other part um, which is very critical as as well Okay, Michelle. Yeah, I um, I am thoroughly impressed and um, with everyone and all, all your roles, and I think this is wonderful. I would love to come out and visit and learn Please more do. personally. And I, I think, um, you know, we work with partnership districts, you know, and that, um, and it seems like a lot of the things you're doing falls into the top ten and ten, the priorities of of, of uh, MDE. Yes, but. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, just say how impressed I was and, um, and your attention to all these details um, I think is, uh, is, is, is right on the money. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Yes, Nikki. Can you leave your contact information with Marilyn? I have a number of questions, but I know we're over time, so I'll just probably share them at another time. Do you have like, like emails? We can get it. We can get it. Kyle's got. Yeah, Kyle sure knows where Kyle everyone lives. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing, and uh, it's inspiring to see different branches of our government working together for our common interest in children. So, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Here today. Thank thank you. you. All right. Uh, we are about. Uh, we've lost uh, about. Uh, 13 minutes, uh, do we, can we eat lunch in an hour and two minutes, or do we need to delay our opening? We're okay, pretty slowly. we're okay with the one o'clock, oh great. <laughs>